My name is Everett Coltrane, and this happened to me on July 22, 1994. Back then I wasn't gray around the temples, not like now. I was fresh out of the military, looking for a fight, and damn if I didn't find it. Unit 56, that's what they called us. Off the books, buried so deep in bureaucracy even the Secretary of Defense probably didn't know we existed. Our mission? Hunting the things the government claimed were just tall tales, relics of campfire stories. Folks here, cryptids, they think Bigfoot, maybe the Loch Ness Monster. Those were the cute ones. We dealt in the real nightmares. This hunt took us to Arizona, middle of freaking nowhere. Small town named Sutter Creek, practically clinging on to life on the edge of the desert. Place had that faded glory vibe, like it was stuck in some old western movie. Folks around there whispered about people going missing, mostly hikers, the kind who strayed off the beaten path. Sheriff blamed it on exposure, mountain lions, the usual. We knew better. The team was my usual crew, me Davis, an ex-cop with a sharp eye and a cynicism sharper, and Hayes, our greenhorn. Eager kid, reminded me a bit of myself back when I thought I was bulletproof. We spent a few days sniffing around, pretending to be from some environmental study nobody had heard of. Classic small-town stuff, gossip swirled faster than desert wind. Locals were getting edgy. We were too. Then came the first body. Not much left of him, to be honest. Hiker, from the bits of gear we found. What was left of him was, desiccated is the only word for it. Skin shrunken tight to the bone, eyes wide open in a silent scream like he'd been sucked dry. Never seen anything like it. Sheriff wasn't too happy to have us horning in on his jurisdiction, but after seeing that, he shut up real quick. That night, we hunkered down in a dusty motel, the kind with flickering neon signs and thin walls. Didn't get much sleep. You develop a kind of sixth sense on this job, a prickle on the back of your neck that means trouble's just around the corner. Morning came, and we split up. Hayes took point on interviewing locals. Davis went to map out the disappearances, looking for patterns. Me, I hit the desert. Figured ground zero was the best place to start. Figured wrong. The desert has a way of disorienting you. All that sand, those scraggly bushes... It gets monotonous real fast. Hours went by. Sun beat down, scorching my neck. I found nothing worth a damn. No tracks, no scat, nothing that pointed to whatever shredded that hiker. Frustrated, I radioed in, ready to admit I was hitting a dead end. That's when I saw the cave. It was tucked near the base of a rock formation, almost hidden from sight. Wasn't much to look at, but my gut instinct, the one that's kept me alive this long, screamed at me to get a closer look. Davis's voice crackled over the radio. Coltrane, you copy? We got eyes on something. Hayes spotted movement big, heading your way. The hair on my arms went up. The cave loomed closer, a black maw in the sun-bleached rock. I weighed my options. Follow the protocol, regroup with the team, maybe face down whatever Hayes had spotted, strength the numbers or, take a gamble, trust my gut, follow that shadowed opening into the unknown. Sometimes, you gotta go with instinct, even if it's screaming at you to run the other way. I keyed the radio. Negative Davis. Change of plans. Investigating a lead. We'll report back shortly. Before Davis's inevitable protest could crackle through, I switched the radio off. I took a deep breath, the dry desert air scratching my throat, and stepped into the cave. Darkness swallowed me whole. My flashlight cut a weak path through the gloom. 
tunnel went on longer than I expected, twisting and sloping downwards. The air was still, stale, carrying a faint metallic scent that pricked at the back of my nose. Then I heard it, a rustling, a scrabble of something moving just beyond the edge of my light. My heart pounded a steady rhythm against my ribs. Hayes? Davis? Anyone copy? I whispered into the void, voice barely above a breath. Only silence answered. Suddenly, a shape lunged from the shadows, claws flashing, a guttural snarl echoing in the close space. I rolled, scrambling back, my flashlight tumbling from my grasp. I fumbled for my pistol, training it on the darkness, fingers squeezing the trigger. Gunfire roared in the cave, deafening blasts that echoed and multiplied until I couldn't tell where the hell the shots were coming from. Then, just as suddenly as it attacked, the creature retreated, a chittering hiss fading into the depths. My ears rang with the gunshot's aftermath. I blinked, trying to clear the spots from my eyes, the flashlight a lost cause somewhere in the dusty chaos. Panic prickled at my skin, the kind that sends a man running blind. But I held, straining my ears, trying to pick up any sounds of pursuit. Nothing. Just the heavy thump of my own heart. I had to move, get out of this lightless trap. I fumbled around blindly, fingers brushing against cold stone, until I found what I was hoping for, a slight draft, a hint of air movement. There had to be another way out of this cave. Scrambling forward on my hands and knees, I followed the faint current, ignoring the scrape of rock on skin. Minutes went by, or maybe hours, time lost all meaning in that underground maze. Then, finally, I saw it, a pinprick of light up ahead. I crawled toward it, hope flaring in my chest. The light grew stronger, the air fresher, until I burst out of the tunnel onto a rocky ledge, blinking against the sudden onslaught of sunlight. I sucked in a lungful of air, the taste of copper tangy in my mouth, then I took in my surroundings. I was halfway up a cliff face. Far below, the scrubby desert stretched out in an endless expanse, with the glint of Sutter Creek visible way off in the distance. It dawned on me, with a sickening twist of vertigo, how lucky I was to have stumbled out here instead of plummeting to my death in some unseen chasm. But I wasn't safe yet. I scanned the rock face, searching for a way down and cursing myself for venturing in here so recklessly. Then something flickered in my peripheral vision, movement above. My blood ran cold. Perched on a ledge higher up was the creature. It was crouched low, its lean body silhouetted against the cloudless sky. The thing was about the size of a man, but the proportions were all wrong. Limbs too long, spine curved in an unnatural arch. Its head was smooth and tapered devoid of eyes or ears that I could see, just a slit of a mouth pulled back in a grotesque grin. It regarded me with a chilling stillness. Wasn't fear I felt in that moment. It was an unsettling certainty. This thing, it was intelligent, a predator sizing up its prey. I raised my gun, hands shaking, and fired. The shot echoed off the rocks. The creature hissed, a piercing screech that set my teeth on edge, but it didn't retreat. It watched, calculating. I fired again, and again, until my gun clicked empty. Still, it didn't move. Desperation clawed at me. No more bullets, no radio, and no way down off this accursed cliff without ending up a bloody mess on the rocks below. The creature shifted its muscles rippling under taut, sickly pale skin. It was getting ready to pounce. Then, the sound of a helicopter cut through the air. My heart leapt. Salvation, or something like it. The black chopper swooped into view, its rotors whipping up a sandstorm. It circled once, twice, 
and then descended the cliff face, hovering just a few feet above my ledge. A rope ladder dropped. A voice, amplified and distorted, blared from the chopper. Cold train! Get on, now! I didn't hesitate. I scrambled over, grabbing hold of the rungs, my raw palms stinging. They hoisted me up into the belly of the beast. Slamming the hatch shut, they didn't even give me a chance to catch my breath. The chopper took off, leaving the cliff face behind. Inside was haze. Kid looked white as a sheet, eyes wide. Some men from a tactical unit I didn't recognize were there too, all suited up in night vision goggles and fancy gear. We circled Sutter Creek once, but there was no sign of the creature. How'd you know I was there? I finally gasped out, leaning against the chopper wall. Hayes shook his head. Wasn't me. We tracked movement in the desert, something big, inhuman. Figured it was you, or what was left of you. I said nothing, just stared out the window as the desert shrank away. We landed at a makeshift base on the outskirts of town. As soon as I hit the ground, they surrounded me, scientists buzzing with questions, medics poking and prodding, some stern-faced suits whose government authority barking orders. The aftermath is the part one hate most. The debriefs, the psyche evals, the veiled threats about classified information. They took my eyewitness account, twisted it until it fit their narrative. Specimen escaped, containment breach, the usual lies they spin to keep the public complacent. The worst part came later. They found Davis. What was left of him, out in the desert, shredded like that first hiker. The creature, cornered, had turned on one of its hunters. Sutter Creek got a cover story. Chemical spill, some nonsense they cooked up. Hayes, he quit the unit after that. I heard he became a park ranger somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. Guess he figured if he was going to stare into the abyss, it might as well be a pretty one. Me, I stuck around. Someone has to do this job, even if it means sacrificing a piece of your sanity with each hunt. See, the thing about monsters that lurk in the shadows is, they ain't afraid of the light. You shine in on them. They just find deeper darkness to hide in. And something tells me, out there in those forgotten corners of the world, that creature is still watching, still waiting, that unsettling grin etched on its smooth, blind face. Maybe we damaged it, maybe we made it cautious, but we sure as hell didn't stop it. So yeah, Unit 56 is still out there, plugging the holes in the fabric of reality. Only difference is, now I know those holes are a hell of a lot bigger than we first thought, and the patches are wearing thin every damn day. It happened years ago, back when I worked as a backcountry guide around the Chokoloski area. Name's Wyatt and my family's been fishing those waters for generations. Know the place like the back of my hand, tides, oyster bars, the secret mangrove spots where the snook hide. Still, there's always that feeling out there, like you're never truly alone. Day started off like any other. I was taking a couple out, retirees from up north, looking to catch something they could brag about. The husband, Tom, he was all gung-ho about landing a giant tarpon. Wife, Eleanor, was more interested in birdwatching, but she tagged along. Now, those ten thousand islands are a maze of channels and bays. Even with GPS, you can get turned around if you're not careful. Tom wanted to push further and then I was usually comfortable with, said he'd pay extra for the real Everglades experience. Sometimes those types, it's not about the fish, it's about bragging rights. Fine with me as long as they signed the waiver. 
We headed into the backwaters, the mangroves closing in on both sides. The air got heavy and still, even the usual racket of insects quieted down. Sun beat down something fierce. I felt uneasy, that prickled down my neck that means it's time to turn back. But Tom kept on, waving his expensive rod like he was conducting an orchestra. Finally, we reach a spot so narrow the boat barely squeezes through. Water gets dark, tan and stained so you can't see the bottom. Ancient cypress all around, branches draped in Spanish moss. Place felt old, untouched. Tom casts his line. The waiting game begins. Eleanor watches the herons perched on the roots, snapping pictures. I try to relax, but I can't shake the feeling we don't belong here. Then, Tom's reel starts spinning. Line goes taut. Rod bends like it's going to snap. Got one! He shouts, and the fight is on. But this thing, it's no fish I've ever seen. It doesn't jump the way tarpon do, just pulls, a relentless drag that threatens to swamp the boat. We get a glimpse of it as it thrashes at the surface, huge and scaly, dark green like the back of an old gator. Then Eleanor screams. Not a scared scream, a shocked one. She's pointing at something bobbing in the water near the boat. At first, I think it's a log. Then I realize it's a body. Face down. Bloated. Fisherman's clothes shredded around the legs. My blood runs cold. There'd been reports of people gone missing in the area. But you always think it won't happen to you, out here in the broad daylight. Before I can even shout a warning, the water beside the boat erupts. The creature, whatever it hooked, bursts forth, so close I could have reached out and touched it. It was massive, thick as a tree trunk, and twice as long as my boat. Scaled hide gleamed wetly in the sunlight. Its head was long, tapered, teeth like railroad spikes. But what got me were the eyes, cold and yellow, intelligent in a way that sent shivers down my spine. The monster didn't pause, just lunged straight at Tom. He screamed, lost his grip on the rod, and tumbled overboard. Eleanor yelled, lunged for him, but it was too late. The creature struck, not like a gator strike, but like, like a snake. It coiled around Tom, crushing him. I heard the snap of bone loud as a gunshot. It dragged him under, disappearing into the murky depths. Eleanor stared, face white as a sheet. I reacted on instinct then, grabbed the spare paddle, and shoved away from the bank. Had to force Eleanor onto the boat. She was still staring at the spot where her husband vanished, like she was waiting for him to come back up. I spun the boat around, paddled like a man-man back the way we'd come. Didn't look behind me, but I could feel that thing watching, waiting. Eleanor snapped out of it finally, started screaming, thrashing about. I had to knock her out with the paddle it was that, or lose her overboard too. We didn't stop till we hit the main channel, flagged down a passing airboat. They took us back to civilization. Eleanor ended up in a psychiatric ward. Couldn't explain why her husband was missing, why she'd been found half-drowned in a swamp miles from any road. I told the park rangers everything, described the creature in detail. They didn't believe me, of course. Said it was probably a rogue gator or a Burmese python, maybe even a hoax, a way to drum up tourism. Search parties went out, but they never found a trace of Tom or a gator big enough to do what I saw. The story got around, though. Some locals looked at me funny after that, and the tourists dried up some. Don't blame him. Who wants to go fishing when there's that out there? These days, I stick to the safer waters closer to the coast. Never go deep into the mangroves again. Sometimes, at night, I dream I'm back in that narrow channel, 
the sun beating down, the water so still. And I see that monstrous head rise from the depths, those yellow eyes fixed on me. Some folks say, those old stories you hear about the Everglades, the ones about giant snakes and swamp monsters, just tall tales to scare the kids. They say the real danger is getting lost, getting dehydrated, the heat stroke. Maybe they're right. Maybe what I saw was just a sun-induced hallucination. But whenever I see that murky water, the tangle of roots and the dark spaces beneath, a part of me remembers. Remembers those eyes, that crushing strength, and the fading scream of a man being dragged into hell. The old-timers call creatures like that the swamp boogeyman. Turns out, the boogeyman's real, and he's hungry. This happened to me on October 6, 2003, out in the Mount Rainier National Park. I'm Kai, search and rescue. Love these woods, or at least I used to. Dad always said a man was lucky to find a job that makes him part of the land he cares about. These days, that feels less like a blessing and more like a curse. Got a call about two college kids, Tyson and Brooke gone missing on a planned overnight hike. They were good kids, by all reports. Experienced outdoors, knew the area, had all the right gear. Didn't make a lot of sense that they'd go off the grid without contacting someone. Figured maybe their phones died somehow, or a minor injury slowed them down. Accidents happen out here, even to the prepared. Started my search up their marked trail. Rainier's a different kind of forest. Ancient trees, the kind that make you feel small, with thick, tangled undergrowth. The air always feels a bit heavier here, the silence a bit deeper, like the trees themselves hold secrets older than any of us. The trail wound higher into old-growth territory, the shadows growing longer in the late afternoon sun. Found their campsite just as dusk started to settle in. Something was off, though. It felt, empty isn't the right word. More like the life had been sucked out of it. Rucksack ripped open, supplies scattered, no sign of a struggle, and zero footprints aside from their own. Started calling their names, the sound strangely muffled, swallowed by the trees. That's when the uneasy feeling in my gut turned into a knot of ice. Something was definitely wrong, but my brain couldn't quite keep up with the animal instinct screaming at me to get out. I radioed back to base, detailing what I saw, trying to keep the tremble out of my voice. Then I heard a snap from deeper in the trees. Not an animal breaking a twig too sharp, too deliberate. My heart kicked into double time. For a terrible second, I hesitated. All those survival instincts my dad pounded into my brain warred with the cold fear snaking up my spine. Curiosity lost out to self-preservation, and I turned and sprinted back down the trail. That's when I saw it. Hulking silhouette in the deepening twilight, hunched over something on the ground. Maybe at first, if the light played tricks on my eyes, I might have mistaken it for a bear. But the shape was all wrong, too stretched, too angular. And as it rose to its full height, a height that seemed impossible, I knew. No bear, that. I'll never forget it, the elongated head with too many teeth crowded into its muzzle, and those eyes. They burned yellow in the dusk, a hunger so vast, so predatory, that it made my blood freeze in my veins. The way it tilted its head, studying me, sizing me up, I was nothing but me to it, another victim in its hunting ground. Adrenaline surged. I dropped my pack, turned, and bolted, not even trying to follow the trail, just crashing through the woods. Branches whipped at my face, roots tried to trip me, but I kept going, fueled purely by panic. 
Behind me, I heard its footfalls, heavy and swift in a way that made no biological sense. With each thud that echoed through the trees, I pictured Brooke's body back at the campsite, the unnatural stillness of it, the way everything had felt broken and wrong near that place. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't an animal leaving behind leftovers. It was playing with me. I knew it. Drawing out the chase, enjoying the sport of it, the taste of my terror. Suddenly, a rifle cracked through the air. The creature let out a piercing shriek that set my teeth on edge before it vanished into the underbrush. Moments later, I was surrounded by my team, weapons leveled, voices shouting my name. They were a blur to me. All I could do was point back in the direction it had disappeared, babbling something about its eyes, its wrongness, its impossible form disappearing into the trees. The rest, it's the blurry part. Reports. Questions asked on repeat, my words stumbling and rushed. The way my team looked at me, a mix of concern and skepticism, like I was the one who wasn't all there anymore. And then, the worst part visiting Tyson and Brooke's families. Telling them there were no traces, no clues, and gently, so very gently, asking if maybe there was something going on at home, anything that might make two experienced hikers just disappear. The look on their faces, that's something I'll carry with me forever. The official explanation for Brooke and Tyson, lost, presumed dead. The folks around here have a name for the creature I saw. The lanky man, they call it. Stories whispered with annoying glance, campfire tales meant to spook kids. Now I wonder. They talk about its impossible reach, its unnatural hunger, of the way it plucks people from the shadows and leaves nothing behind. They talk about a creature that shouldn't exist, and they don't even know the half of it. I transferred to dispatch a while back. Couldn't face the deep woods anymore, not after that night. I told them it was the families, that the job got too heavy. They understood, or at least pretended to. But out there, in the towering trees and ancient hush of the Rainier Woods, I know it's still lurking. It knows I got away. Sometimes, on long nights behind the radio... I think I can feel its eyes on me, hot and predatory. Maybe it remembers the taste of my fear. Maybe, one day, when everyone has forgotten my story, when they've written me off as just another ranger with too much stress, it will decide to come for me, to finish the hunt it started all those years ago. There are shifts when the wind whistles through the lines just right, carrying the barest hint of that same chilling rasp I heard in the woods that day. On those nights, I sit very still, fingers clenched around my coffee mug, pretending the warmth of it has anything to do with the cold that settles deep in my bones. Maybe most days I can convince myself it was just shadows, a trick of the eye, an overtired mind playing games. But on nights like that I know better. I know monsters are real, and mine waits out there in the darkness, biding its time. This happened to me on October 3, 2001, just a few weeks after the towers fell. Reckon the whole world was upside down that fall so my troubles hardly seemed worth mentioning. But they were mine, those woods were mine, and whatever stalked in the shadows, it made them a hell of a lot less friendly. Folks call me Silas. I've lived off the grid my whole life, raised on a patch of land up in the Adirondacks that's been in my family for generations. My cabin sits back up on a winding trail most folks would miss if they weren't looking hard for it. Grew up hunting, trapping, making do with what the woods provide. City life always held about as much appeal as a rabid raccoon in the hen house. 
There's something about the quietude of those woods that seeps into your bones. Not lonely, mind you, just peaceful. I liked it that way. Until that fall, the worst sound I ever heard up there was a bear getting into the honey barrels, or maybe the occasional idiotic tourist stumbling around lost. It started with those howls. Can't say now why I didn't think wolf straight off. Maybe it was the pitch, too deep and guttural for even a big old alpha of a pack. I'd heard wolves before, but this sounded wrong. The first night, I convinced myself it was a trick of the wind. Second time, I wondered if some local dog had wandered way farther from home than it ought. By the third night, my hair stood on end every time the cry echoed down from the ridge. One afternoon, I was chopping wood out back when I heard it again, only closer this time, clear as day. My old hound dog, Tucker, perked up too. But he wasn't growling or barking, he was whining, tail tucked low. Animals know things we don't. Figured I had enough sitting around waiting to become whatever that thing's next dinner. Grabbed my rifle and followed the sound up the ridge. Sun was setting, casting long shadows, making it hard to see. Then I smelled it, a mix of rotting meat and something iron sharp, like blood that's been sitting out too long. Found the source soon enough. What was left of a deer carcass sprawled across a patch of mossy rocks. The body had been ripped open, worse than any bear or cougar would do. No delicate eating, this was about raw power. Bones were picked clean, snapped like twigs. Worst was the skull, perched on a high rock like a damned trophy. My stomach turned. Tucker whimpered, refusing to go closer. I scanned the woods, my rifle twitching in my grip. The hair on my neck prickled with the certainty of being watched. But I saw nothing but trees in the deepening twilight. Just when I started to feel like a fool, a branch snapped on the ridge above. Something big moved up there, vanishing into the leaves. Tucker bolted, and I wasn't far behind him. The next few weeks were a blur of sleepless nights and uneasy routines. Kept the rifle close, checked traps double, tripled the defenses around my goats. I saw signs of the thing everywhere. Huge tracks pressed into the mud, wider and longer than any dog. Ragged fur snagged on branches, dark and coarse as wire. That goat awful howl splitting the night. I even started finding gifts. That's what I called them in my head, anyway. A rabbit carcass laid out neatly on my doorstep or a mangled bird deposited on the woodpile as if someone was taunting me. One gray morning, the worst one yet, I went to check the goats. Instead of their usual bleeding, I got silence. That heavy, sinking kind that sits in your gut like a stone. The pen was torn to pieces. One goat was gone entirely, the other lay twisted and broken on the ground. But worst of all was the blood splattered everywhere, like some mad painter had used the pen walls as his canvas. The rifle felt pitifully small in my trembling hands. That's when I knew the woods weren't mine anymore. Something out there was marking its territory, and I was in it. Wasn't safe, not even with the rifle and all my traps. There was a cunning I couldn't fight a brutality that felt deeper than just the need to hunt. Spent two days burning most of what I couldn't carry. The cabin I'd built with my own two hands, it went up in flames. Each crackle of the burning timbers echoed like a gunshot. When I finally walked away, the smoke stung my eyes, but not so much as the failure lodged in my throat. Ended up down south, working on an old farm. Not even close to the same, but it was something, honest work. Sometimes on those long nights, I swear I hear that low growl carried on the wind. I know folks think I was half-crazed by the whole thing, maybe even made it all up. 
But I remember that feeling of being watched in the woods, the unnaturalness of it all. I remember those trophies, the blood on the leaves, the deer skull gleaming like a demon in the moonlight. Now I tell myself that I got out alive, that maybe that's enough. Some nights, I almost believe it. But then the farm dog whimpers in his sleep, a dark shape flickers at the edge of my vision, and I feel sure of one thing, it followed me. Out of the wilds and into this too bright, too populated world. And it's still out there. The paper's out in New York a few years back. They called it a series of unexplained animal mutilations. Farmers finding livestock ripped to pieces, even some pet dogs. Said it could be wolves, or some kind of hybrid breed that moved into the territory. Made my blood run cold. But I kept my mouth shut, knew nobody would credit an old hermit's ravings against whatever official explanation they cooked up. Sometimes I think the creature wants something from me. Like I didn't run hard enough, or far enough, and the whole damn world is its hunting ground now. Or maybe it knows I saw the truth in the woods, what it really is. Maybe that makes me a loose end it wants to tidy up. You tell yourself it can't follow you from the deep woods to the streets and houses and crowds. You tell yourself you're imagining things, getting jumpy, like the whole world's an echo of what you left behind. But that feeling in your bones, that prickle that says you're not safe, not even in your sleep, that doesn't lie. Sometimes, in those dark hours before dawn, a dog howls somewhere in the distance— it's closer than it used to be. Could be I'm losing my damn mind. Or could be it's finally closing in. They call it the bone collector. Some cryptozoology freak named it that on one of those online forums. Suits it well enough, I reckon. But I ain't interested in what it's called. Only how to keep it from finding me. From collecting one last trophy for its gruesome hoard. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip to Alaska. Call me Rowan. I was working construction in Anchorage at the time. Needed some time off after a rough season, so I rented a camper and figured on exploring that Denali wilderness everybody talks about. Guy needs some mountains after too much of the city, right? First few days, it was everything the brochures promised. Glaciers, bears and that big empty feeling you get in places so wild. I had the whole campground mostly to myself, set up by a lake, did some fishing. All real National Geographic stuff. Then, the third night, I woke up to scratching at the camper walls. Sounded like nails on metal, high-pitched, and kind of frantic. I froze, thinking about those grizzlies they warn you about. I grabbed a flashlight, cracked the window to peek out. No bear, that's for sure. But what I saw, it ain't right. Crouched under a tree not twenty feet away was the biggest damn wolf I'd ever seen. Even in the half-light, it was huge, easily six feet at the shoulder if it stood up. But here's the thing, it didn't look natural. For too dark, almost black, and its head, the snout was too long, the eyes, wrong color somehow. I fumbled for my phone to get a picture, but when I looked back, it was gone. I didn't sleep much after that. Next morning, found tracks all around the camper. Big ones, but not quite bare paws, and only two legs. It was walking upright, whatever it was. Should have left then. But something in me, some stupid stubborn part, wanted to stay. See if I could track it down, explain it away. That was how I ended up miles off any trails, following those oversized paw prints through the dense spruce forest. Sun got low, the air took on that eerie stillness you get before dark in those parts. The tracks led deeper, 
and a feeling prickled on the back of my neck, feeling of being watched. I wasn't imagining it. Up ahead, half hidden in the low branches of a spruce, there it was. The creature, staring right at me. Its form was clearer now, tall, lanky, covered in that dark, matted fur. Its muzzle was like a wolf's but stretched out, its teeth bared in a snarl that wasn't quite animal. And the eyes, they glowed yellow, reflecting the fading light. It was more than a predator. There was a cunning in those eyes that chilled me worse than any sub-zero wind. I did what any sensible person would do then. I turned and ran. Didn't look back. Didn't care if I tripped or broke a leg. Just ran blind through the trees until my lungs screamed and my legs gave out. Then I crawled, scrambling over roots, the darkness closing in. Somehow, and I don't know if it was luck, blind panic, or something else, I found the old logging road I'd half noticed on the way out. Stumbled back along it towards the distant lights of the camper, hearing the rustle of movement somewhere parallel in the thick forest. It was toying with me, I realized, hunting me for sport. The camper was a beacon then, the only hope in that vast wilderness. It felt like hours getting there, though it must have only been a few. Fumbled with the keys, got inside, slammed the door shut. Through the filthy windshield, those yellow eyes stared at me, unblinking. The camper shook as the creature circled trying to find a way inside. It didn't leave. All night, I listened to those claws scraping, the guttural moaning sounds. I barely breathed, terrified it would catch my scent. Near dawn, the noises finally stopped. I waited until the sun was high before I dared to stick my head out. The tracks led off into the trees. It was gone for now. I packed up faster than I'd done anything in my life, left half my gear behind. Drove straight out of there, didn't stop till I was on the outskirts of Anchorage. Nobody believed me when I told them. Rangers said wolves ain't native to that part of the park. Some tourists said they'd seen a big black dog lurking around. Wrote it all off as me being sleep-deprived, maybe seeing things in the spooky woods but I know what I saw. They say there are old stories around here about creatures that hunt in the wild places. Legends about things not quite animal, things the locals called dogmen. Never paid them no mind before, sounded like fairy tales for kids. Now, well, now sometimes I wake up at night, feeling eyes on me in the dark, feeling watched. And I wonder, did it follow me home? This happened to me a few years back, just after I finished college. Needed to get out of the city, and when a family friend offered me a summer job house-sitting their place in Alaska, I jumped at the chance. What could possibly go wrong in the middle of nowhere, right? Wrong. My name's Noah, by the way. The house was way out there. Not a proper town, more like an outpost on the edge of the Denali wilderness. A few scattered cabins, a general store, and miles of trees in every direction. The kind of place where folks knew your name, and way too much about your business, within five minutes of you arriving. First few weeks were great. I hiked, I fished, I even tried my hand at painting the insane Alaskan landscapes. Then the headaches started. Not normal headaches, these were skull-splitting, the kind that make you see spots. Went to the tiny local clinic, the doc figured it was altitude sickness combined with stress, gave me some pills and told me to take it easy. Only it didn't help. Headaches got worse, and I started having these dreams. Vivid as hell, and always the same, me running through the trees with something big and dark chasing. I could feel its breath on my neck in those dreams, 
hot and stinking of rotting meat. Hear those claws clicking behind me on the frozen ground. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, hard pounding. Started leaving the light on when I slept. The locals noticed the change in me, of course. They started with those concerned glances, the lowered voices when they thought I wasn't listening. Then came the whispers. Stories about old legends, things that walked the forests, took those who strayed too far off the path. I scoffed, told myself it was small-town superstition, but deep down, a cold fear started settling in my gut. Then, one night, I made the mistake of looking out the window. I saw it, standing just at the edge of the trees, illuminated by the porch light. Way too tall to be a bear, hunched over on two legs. Fur matted like old rope, muzzle dripping with what looked like blood. Those eyes burned bright in the darkness, filled with a hunger that chilled me to the bone. I backed away from the window, hands shaking as I reached for my phone. No signal, of course. Too damn remote. The thing, creature, whatever the hell it was, didn't come closer to the house that night, but I got the distinct sense it was watching me. Every creak of the old floorboards, every rustle of the wind became proof that it was just outside, waiting. The next morning, I went to the old gun cabinet in the basement, found a rifle and a box of ammo, dust thick on both. My hands trembled as I loaded it, the sound of each metallic click echoing in the silence. I waited till nightfall, sitting by the window with the rifle cradled in my lap. It felt insane, like something out of a horror movie. It came back just before midnight. I saw its huge form slinking between the trees, heading straight for the house. I aimed the rifle at the open front door, finger hovering over the trigger, and waited. The creature stepped into the light. Its claws scraped the wooden porch with a screech that set my teeth on edge. And then it saw me. It let out a low growl, the sound vibrating through the walls. I held my breath and fired. The shot echoed in the night, and the creature staggered back with a howl of rage. It didn't fall. I missed the damn thing, or maybe just wounded it. Then it was lunging towards the open door, claws outstretched. I ran. Back door, out into the pitch-black woods. I could hear the creature tearing through the house behind me, the sound of splintering wood echoing through the night. I stumbled through the undergrowth, branches whipping at my face, not caring where I went as long as it was away from that house, away from that thing. Tripped over a fallen log, sprawling face first into the cold earth. My lungs burned, and I had a stitch in my side so sharp I could barely breathe. I forced myself up, scrambling forward blindly. I knew staying still meant death. The night was a kaleidoscope of terror, the crunch of leaves beneath panicked feet, the snapping of branches, the roar of that creature somewhere off to my right. It was gaining on me, I could feel it. I stumbled out onto a narrow dirt road, the sight of it filling me with a desperate surge of hope. Civilization? Maybe a car? Please, anything but those woods. Then I heard a different noise, the whine of an engine growing louder. Headlights speared through the darkness straight towards me. A beat-up old truck, the kind the locals favored. Maybe my salvation. I started waving, yelling until my voice was hoarse. The truck screeched to a halt, dust swirling. I staggered to the driver's side window, heart pounding with relief. But as the window rolled down, my relief turned to a new, icy kind of fear. The man inside was old, with eyes so pale they seemed almost white. He wasn't smiling, wasn't saying anything, just staring at me with an expression that made my skin crawl. Help me! I gasped, breath misting on the chilled glass. Something's chasing me, in the woods. 
he still didn't speak. Then he shifted in his seat, and I saw the shotgun lying across his lap. My blood ran cold. This wasn't help. It was something else entirely. Before I could react, the passenger door flew open. A woman, scraggly hair, face tight with tension, grabbed my arm. Get in, she hissed, her voice low. Hurry! I hesitated for a second, torn between the terror of the unknown woods and the terror of this truck. Then the creature let out a deafening bellow, impossibly close. I scrambled into the truck, the woman slamming the door behind me. The tires screeched as the truck shot forward. I glanced back. Through the trees, I saw massive dark shapes surge into the road, bathed for a moment in the harsh glow of the truck's taillights. Then, we were swallowed by the night again. We drove in silence for what felt like hours, the truck bumping and jolting along dark, narrow roads. The woman sat hunched and tense beside me, staring out into the darkness. The old man still hadn't spoken a single word. Finally, the truck pulled into the rutted driveway of a ramshackle farmhouse. The woman turned to me, the dim interior light finally revealing her fully. She wasn't just scared, she was haunted. I realized I wasn't out of the woods yet, merely trading one nightmare for a different, unknown one. I'm Callie, she finally said, her voice rough. That's my pa. You're safe here for now. Safe? I echoed, incredulous. From what? That creature back there? Callie shook her head. That's just one of them. This whole place, it's bad. Old. Something flickered in her eyes, a mix of resignation and despair. They took me into the creaky house, the floorboards groaning beneath our feet. Callie's paw flicked on a few dim lamps, revealing worn furniture and faded photographs of people whose eyes seemed to follow me from the walls. My ma disappeared out here years back, Callie told me bluntly, as if discussing the weather. Pa thinks one of them, things, took her. I shivered, fear coiling in my gut like a snake. They didn't explain more. Instead, they gave me spare clothes, a plate of cold food, and a cot tucked into a corner of the attic. Rest, Callie murmured before turning away. You'll need it for what comes next. Sleep was impossible. The house seemed to creak and whisper, and the image of that creature, snarling in the doorway, was burned into my brain. I tossed and turned, the events of the night replaying in my head. Morning came, pale light filtering through the dusty attic window. When I went downstairs, the smell of bacon and something burning hit me. Callie was hunched over a stove, her pa sitting silently at the kitchen table. I started to ask them what the plan was, whether we should run, contact the authorities, do anything. Then I heard it. A low, rumbling growl, circling the house. We froze. They're back, Callie whispered. Her pa stood up, the shotgun swinging into his weathered hands. They both looked at me, not with pity, but with a chilling determination. The growling grew closer. I backed away from the window as the sound of scraping claws hit the porch. In that moment, I knew what was coming and realized the tragic truth. There was no escape from this place. We were all just prey waiting in a trap. The aftermath was messy and swift. I don't like to remember the specifics, just flashes. The splintering of the door, those terrible yellow eyes in the gloom, the screams, mine, Callie's, the old man's. Then silence. When the police finally came, alerted by a neighbor who'd heard the commotion, they found an empty house soaked with blood. No bodies, nothing but questions that would forever remain unanswered. The official report mentioned a possible bear attack, or some deranged drifter.
This happened to me a few years back, out in the Ozarks. See, I'm a city guy, always have been. Got a good job, an apartment, all the usual nonsense. But a few times a year, I disappear. Not the usual vacation. I drive deep, find some off-grid cabin rental, and spend a week just unplugging. Sometimes it's hiking, sometimes just reading on the porch. My kind of reset, I guess. Stupid in hindsight, right? Being alone out in the middle of nowhere. This particular trip, I'd found a place in the Mark Twain National Forest, real backwoods of Missouri. Cabin was a converted fire tower, had this incredible 360-degree view. Got settled in, the sun was setting, the view was pure magic. The feeling wasn't. There was a tension hanging heavy in the air, a sense I wasn't alone. I told myself that was nonsense, just nerves. Yet, the feeling didn't fade. Next morning, I decide to do a day hike, stretch the legs. There's a trail winding through the hills behind the cabin. I set off, and that's when I started noticing the signs. Ripped branches, bits of fur, and a peculiar smell like, well, like a zoo enclosure gone wrong. I was on alert, scanning my surroundings like a madman. I didn't see anything, but the feeling of being watched only grew worse. I reached the peak just as the sun started dipping below the horizon. Something moved down in the valley below. I froze. First, I thought it was a bear, dark against the fading light. But this thing moved wrong. It was big, upright for a split second, then down on all fours like a huge dog. My heart hammered in my chest. This was no bear. The creature didn't notice me. I edged back and bolted down the trail. Something like a growl echoed behind me, sending chills down my spine. I ran until my legs burned, then stumbled right into an old shed, collapsing onto the dirt floor. I lay there till dawn, hardly daring to breathe. When morning finally broke, I made a run for my vehicle didn't stop till I was back in civilization. A few days later, I couldn't resist the urge. I looked into missing person cases in that area. Turns out, several solo hikers had vanished around the time I was there. I tried telling myself they got lost, that there was a logical explanation. But I knew it was a lie. I also knew exactly what I'd seen. Words started getting out. Whispers on some outdoors of forums, then an article in a local paper. They'd found a body, torn to shreds. Never identified the victim, never figured out what did it. But the description matched exactly what I'd seen. That huge, misshapen canine shape, too smart for a bear. Locals were muttering about the Ozark Howler, some old folktale about a wolf-like creature that haunted the hills. I didn't give it much thought then. Figured it was local legend to explain the inexplicable. But a few months later, it found me. Back home. My apartment's on the tenth floor. Imagine my surprise when I woke up one night, and those glowing eyes were staring back at me from the balcony. I haven't spent a night alone since. My name's Grant Miller, and this whole mess happened back in November 2008. Back then, I was running with a specialized unit within the CIA, handling jobs that were equal parts dangerous and bizarre. Think less James Bond, more X-Files. I'm the kind of guy who prides himself on staying calm under pressure, but let's just say that experience put my composure to the test. The job seemed simple enough on the surface. Investigate unusual wildlife sightings in a remote section of Yellowstone National Park. 
We thought it was probably some rancher's experiment gone wrong or a hoax to drum up tourism. What we encountered in those woods was, let's just say bears and mountain lions are the least scary things lurking in the American wilderness. Our team was four strong me, Nguyen, Carter, and Brooks. Nguyen was our tech expert, the kind of guy who could hack a UFO if he had to. Carter was the muscle, ex-military with a deadpan sense of humor that would have been funny if we weren't constantly on the brink of getting torn apart. Brooks was our wildlife specialist, and probably the sanest one of the bunch. We set out into the park in early autumn. Yellowstone's a breathtaking place, the kind that reminds you how small a person is in the grand scheme of things. But there was unease in the air, a prickling at the back of my neck that told me those woods weren't as pristine as they seemed. The first few days were mostly about tracking. We found enormous, clawed footprints that didn't match any known animal in the region. Brooks nearly fainted when he found Scott the size of a basketball and one's equipment picked up strange energy readings he swore shouldn't be possible. But the creature itself stayed elusive. We built camp in a clearing near a stream. It felt more exposed than usual, but it was the best we could find given the terrain. Carter rigged the perimeter with infrared sensors as usual, his gruff voice cutting through the silent forest. You think those little wires are gonna stop whatever made those tracks? I asked him, only half joking. He shrugged, his face unreadable in the twilight. Gives us a warning at least. Night fell quickly, and with it came an unnerving silence. No rustling leaves or animal calls, just this oppressive stillness. Nguyen spent the evening hunched over his laptop muttering about corrupted data and impossible frequencies. Sleep was fitful. I woke with a start, a sense of wrongness hanging heavy in the air. It wasn't a sound that woke me, but the absence of it. Suddenly, an air-splitting screech tore through the night. It was high-pitched, filled with fury, and unlike anything I'd ever heard. Carter's perimeter alarms went haywire, flashing madly in the darkness. We got movement, multiple targets, big! His voice was a tense whisper through the comms. I grabbed my rifle and scrambled out of the tent. The others weren't far behind, their faces pale in the beams of our flashlights. Out there, just at the edge of the light, multiple pairs of eyes shone at us, brilliant, predatory yellow. Then the creatures stepped out of the darkness. Each one was a monstrosity. They stood at least seven feet tall, their bodies covered in a thick, matted fur that looked like it could turn aside bullets. But the worst was their heads. Muzzles stretched out into wolf-like snouts filled with jagged, blood-stained teeth. Their eyes burned with that impossible yellow light, filled with a chilling intelligence. We opened fire, the gunshots cracking through the silent forest. The creatures shrieked in rage and charged. Nguyen went down first. One of the creatures lunged for him, its wickedly curved claws ripping through his Kevlar vest, spraying gore across the damp earth. He barely had time to scream. Carter roared and unleashed a fresh volley of gunfire, driving several of the creatures back. He grabbed Nguyen's radio, his voice shaking. We need backup, now! I repeat, we. A terrifying blur of movement, and Carter was gone. Snatched from the ground so fast I barely registered it. All that remained was his gun, lying forgotten in the grass. Brooks and I were back to back, spraying desperate shots into the darkness. One of the creatures went down, a thick black ichor oozing from a chest wound, but there were still at least three of them. They were toying with us, enjoying the hunt. Brooks let out a strangled cry as one of the monsters circled behind him. Before I could react it lunged, its immense jaws clamping around his leg. He screamed in agony, 
firing blindly into the creature, but it dragged him bodily into the trees. His gunshots rang out, then were abruptly, chillingly cut off. I was alone. Panic was a jagged shard of ice in my veins, but I forced it down. There was no time for fear. The smell of blood hung thick in the air, Nguyen's, Carter's, Brooks. It was the smell of death. And those monstrous eyes were still there in the shadows, watching me, calculating. I stumbled backwards, desperately trying to reload as the creatures advanced. Somewhere in the back of my mind, a voice was screaming about protocol, about securing evidence, but all I could think about was survival. Then I tripped over a tree root and tumbled to the ground, my rifle clattering away out of reach. I scrambled back, fumbling blindly in my pack for my backup sidearm. My fingers brushed against the cold metal of the pistol just as a monstrous form leaped towards me. I squeezed the trigger, again and again, the roar of gunfire deafening in the sudden stillness. The creature reared up, its guttural shriek cutting through the night. Dark blood splattered the ground, and with a final, shuddering spasm, it collapsed. My hands shook as I struggled to my feet. But there were still two of them out there. I knew even then that I wasn't going to make it off that mountain. It was just a matter of how long I could hold them off. I wasn't going down without a fight. I fumbled for something, anything in my bag that might give me an edge. My hand closed around a flare. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. With shaking fingers, I struck the flare and hurled it towards the remaining creatures. It landed at their feet, hissing and sparking, casting garish red light across their monstrous forms. They backed away, snarling. Fire, primal and unpredictable. Maybe it spooked them. I took my chance. I sprinted through the trees, ignoring the stabbing pain in my side from my earlier fall. I had no idea where I was going, but anywhere had to be better than that clearing. The creatures roared in anger behind me, but they didn't pursue, at least not immediately. I ran until I thought my lungs would burst. Branches tore at my face and the ground was uneven, but I didn't dare stop. Finally, gasping for breath, I collapsed behind a fallen log the pulse pounding in my ears so loud I could barely hear the creatures crashing through the woods in my wake. How long they searched for me, I don't know. After a while, blessed silence descended. I lay there, my body throbbing, waiting for the inevitable, but the attack never came. Perhaps they had given up, or were waiting for daylight. Either way, it bought me some time. As dawn broke, I pushed myself up and started moving again, stumbling through the dense undergrowth. I had no destination in mind, only the blind instinct to put as much distance as possible between myself and that blood-soaked clearing. By some miracle, I found a ranger station later that day. It was deserted, the radio equipment dead but I managed to patch my wounds and send out a garbled distress signal on the emergency broadcast band. Rescue arrived two days later. My wild story of monsters in the woods was met with skepticism, with thinly veiled assumptions of shock-induced delusions. It took weeks of debriefings and psych evaluations before the brass was satisfied I would keep my mouth shut and fall in line. The aftermath is a blur. There were cover stories, hushed whispers about rogue bear attacks, and missing persons reports quietly buried in park archives. No evidence of the creatures was ever found. My team was declared officially dead, their names added to a memorial somewhere in Langley that they don't make a big show about to the public. I never did go back to the CIA. I left that life behind and tried to bury the memory of that night deep within me. You can go ahead and call me crazy, call me traumatized. I won't argue with you. 
Sometimes, late at night, I see those yellow eyes in the darkness and hear Nguyen's scream echoing through the trees. Most days, I manage to convince myself it was a nightmare, a hallucination born from exhaustion and terror. I tell myself that those creatures couldn't possibly be real, that the rational world I cling to hasn't devolved entirely into chaos. But on some nights, when the wind whispers through the trees outside my window, sounding eerily like a deathly screech, I start to doubt my own sanity. Because I know what I saw out there, what tore my team apart. And in the deepest hours of the night, a terrifying truth remains. We were the lucky ones that day. If those creatures were smart enough to toy with us, to hunt us for sport, who knows how many others they took? There's a darkness in those woods, a primal, ancient hunger. And the most horrifying thought of all is this, perhaps, even now, they're still out there, waiting, watching, and biding their time. My name is David Carter, and this happened to me in September of 1997. Back then, I was just another greenhorn ranger stationed in Glacier National Park. Montana wilderness, beautiful, brutal, and deceptively large. You think you know mountains until they stretch out in every direction, a sea of green and gray peaks hiding God knows what. I grew up in Colorado so I'm no stranger to rough terrain, but there's something different about Glacier. Something old, like the land itself remembers things we've long forgotten. That thought should have set my teeth on edge, a warning bell ignored. But when you're young, you figure you're invincible, even out here. My partner was Allison, a tough, seasoned ranger with the weathered face of someone twice her age. She was showing me the ropes, and I was starting to enjoy the solitary patrols the chance to clear my head after a stint in the Marines. Late one afternoon, just as the sun was starting to dip behind the mountains, we got called out to a remote section of the park near the Canadian border. Couple of hikers hadn't checked back in as planned. Routine stuff, most likely just overly cautious family blowing things out of proportion. We reach the trailhead and start our hike in. The trail winds up a heavily forested slope, the kind of place where the shadows deepen way before sunset. Allison's setting a brisk pace. She's the serious type, all business, while I'm still prone to cracking a stupid joke to break the tension. So, boss, I ask, think those tourists got lost, or think they found Bigfoot? She doesn't even crack a smile. Found themselves in more trouble than they counted on, probably. City folk don't respect the woods. Typical Allison. But as we trek deeper into the trees, a trickle of unease starts gnawing at me. The woods feel empty. I'm used to the sounds of animals, rustling of birds in the leaves, the chirp of insects. None of that here. Just silence, pressing down on us like a blanket. Suddenly, Allison stops and holds up a fist. I go still. She points off into the trees, her voice barely a whisper. Over there. See it? Took me a moment, peering through the dense foliage, but then I see it. A flash of movement, unnaturally quick. And something about the shape, wrong. Too tall, too lean. Definitely not a bear or a mountain lion. Before I can even process it, the thing steps into view on the trail ahead, not twenty yards from us. I freeze. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. Humanoid, but stretched and gaunt like a half-starved animal. Its skin has a strange, mottled gray tone, almost translucent in places so you can see the bones beneath. Its eyes, that's what makes me gasp aloud. Black, like marbles, no whites, just an endless, hungry void. 
It stands there, utterly still, head tilted like it's studying us. I fumble for my radio, but Allison grabs my wrist, her fingers like a steel clamp. Don't, she hisses. Don't make any sudden moves. The creature lets out a clicking sound, high-pitched, almost like an insect. Then, with a lurching movement that sends my heart pounding, it charges. Allison and I take off into the trees, scrambling up a steep slope that flanks the trail. We can hear it crashing through the undergrowth below, snarling and snapping in a way that raises the hair on my arms. We keep running, stumbling over rocks and exposed roots, lungs burning. From below, something crashes against a tree trunk with bone-jarring force. I don't look back. I don't need to. Finally, we burst into a clearing and collapse, gasping for air. Night has fallen. The only light is the sliver of moon cutting through the trees. I reach for my radio, hand shaking as I press the button. Static answers me. I try again. Nothing. Allison's beside me, scanning the tree line. We need to find higher ground, she says tightly. Somewhere this thing can't reach us. There's an outcropping of rock, jagged and uneven, jutting out above us. We scramble towards it, the ascent a nightmare of sharp cuts and slippery moss. Once we reach the top, I collapse again, chest heaving. Allison's already at the edge, peering down into the darkness. Damn, she swears under her breath. I don't see it but it must be close. It knows we're up here. Fear turns my stomach to ice. What do we do? She doesn't reply, just pulls a flare gun from her belt, then turns towards me, expression grim. I'm gonna distract it. You need to find help. Get word out about this thing. Find another ranger, anyone. Tell them. She pauses, takes a steadying breath. Tell them Allison says there's a code 7 in Sector 3. Before I can protest, she lets the flare loose. It bursts red and bright, illuminating the clearing below. And there it is. The creature crouched on its haunches, blinking in the sudden light. It lets out a screech that pierces the night as Allison raises the flare gun again. Go! she yells. I don't need telling twice. I scramble away from the cliff edge, stumbling through dense brush back the way we came. I can hear Allison behind me, shouting, and another flare fires, casting long, flickering shadows over the tree trunks. Then comes a scream, cut brutally short. The echo of that scream propelled me through the woods. I ran blindly, branches whipping at my face, tears mixing with the cold sweat on my brow. I stumbled, fell, got back up, always with the image of Allison and those empty, black eyes burned into my mind. Finally, I burst onto the main trail. My radio was still useless. Damn thing must have got busted in the fall. I had no idea how far I'd run, or where the nearest ranger station was, just that I had to get help, get reinforcements, do something, anything— for Allison. As I ran, a new sound cut through the panic pounding of my pulse, an engine. Then I saw them, headlights cutting through the gloom, a jeep coming up the trail. I staggered into the middle of the road, waving my arms frantically. The jeep screeched to a halt. Two rangers jump out, expressions a mix of alarm and confusion. They know me, luckily, and my uniform, though torn and mud-splattered, gives my frantic words added weight. I blurt out the whole story, the missing hikers, the creature, Allison. I can see that they don't fully believe me, not at first. But there's enough doubt, enough training kicking in, to make them radio for backup. We pile into the jeep and head back into the woods where I left Allison. The clearing is a scene of devastation. The ground is churned up, 
dotted with dark splashes of blood. My blood runs cold, too much blood. Broken branches litter the area, some scored with deep gouges. No sign of the creature, no sign of. Someone shouts my name. Another ranger, a veteran named Jack, is crouched near the cliff base. I race over, heart hammering. Allison is sprawled on the ground, eyes wide open staring sightlessly at the sky. Her body is twisted in a way that makes me want to vomit. Jack shakes his head, his voice low and grim. She's gone, Carter. The rest of the night is a blur. The search for the creature, fruitless. The questions, endless. The transport of Allison's body back to the station. I stumble through it all in a daze, a gnawing guilt clawing at my insides. If only I hadn't suggested that damn hike. If only I'd been faster, stronger. They let me see her one last time, back at the station. She's laid out on a cold metal table, cleaned up, but the horrific injuries are impossible to disguise. I hold her hand. It's icy, the touch sending a shiver through me that has nothing to do with the room's temperature. Finally, I lean down and whisper in her ear, Code 7 in Sector 3, Allison. I told them. The next day, they ship me back to headquarters, cite the trauma, and strongly suggest I take a long leave, maybe even consider a different career path. I don't argue. I know what they think, shell-shocked kid hallucinating monsters in the woods. But I also know what I saw, and what I lost. They scrubbed all records of the incident, of course. Officially, Allison and those hikers simply vanished. Search parties went out for months, found nothing. They called them tragic accidents, unlucky victims of the wild. The easy explanation, the one that lets people sleep soundly, forgetting that darkness can hide in the places we think we know. Weeks turn into months, then years. I never went back to being a ranger. Couldn't bear the sight of those woods that took Allison. I drifted odd jobs, different cities, trying to bury the past. Didn't work. The creature haunted my dreams, its clicking and screeches waking me in a cold sweat. One restless night, I stumbled across an internet forum, a dark corner of the web where people posted stories of strange encounters of things unseen. Hesitantly, I shared my own story, keeping the location vague, omitting identifying details. The responses came, some dismissive, others intrigued, and a few, a chilling few, from people who claimed to have seen something eerily similar in other parks, other remote places. Sightings from across the country, spanning years. And always the same pattern, vanishings, mangled bodies, an unnatural predator that evaded capture. That's when the obsession began. I devoured every scrap of information I could find, grainy photographs of unidentifiable figures lurking just outside the camera's range, fragmented Native American legends that whispered of shadow creatures, cautionary tales about those who ventured off the trails and were never seen again. I started cross-referencing the sightings. They followed a rough pattern. National parks mostly, but isolated, less traveled ones. The victims were almost always those who strayed from the beaten path, seasoned hikers, off-duty rangers, the foolhardy and those who simply had rotten luck. The why kept me up at night. Hunger alone didn't seem to explain it. There was something almost playful in the creature's cruelty, like a cat torturing a mouse. I found myself wondering if it was intelligent, in some twisted way, if it was, enjoying these hunts. I bought the gear, high-powered rifle, night vision goggles, enough supplies to survive out in the wilderness for months. I learned to track, learned how to move silently through the woods, Learn every scrap of wilderness survival I could get my hands on. In my darker moments, 
I wondered if I was simply going mad, driven by grief and a thirst for revenge that I knew would never be fulfilled. Then came the call. From a park ranger in New Mexico a woman who had read one of my posts and recognized the description too well. I booked a flight the next day. It's been five years since then. I'm a ghost now, moving from place to place, following the creature's trail of mangled bodies. The official records say wild animal attacks, freak accidents, the missing simply, lost. But I leave a note behind at each ranger station I pass through, one word, a grim warning to those few who might understand, Code 7. I never sleep in the same spot twice, haven't had a conversation longer than a few minutes with another human being in years. Solitary isn't the same as lonely, I tell myself, but some nights, when the wind whistles through the trees and the shadows seem to shift and stretch in impossible ways, I wonder if I've lost the best part of myself along with Allison. The hunt never ends. Always the same pattern. I arrive too late, find the remnants, try to piece together the creature's movements, and follow. Maybe someday I'll catch up with it. Maybe someday I'll have a clear shot, a bullet through that monstrous skull. Or maybe I'll simply vanish, one more victim claimed by the darkness, one more name added to the tally of missing persons. Either way, there's no other life for me now, no other path to walk. My name's Marcus Jensen, and this all happened to me back in September 2008, Olympic National Park. It's a land of contrasts out there, rugged coastline, those fairy tale rainforests, the glacier-covered peaks. Been working park service on and off since college, mostly in the West. You learn a healthy respect for the wilderness, for those places where nature still holds all the cards. I was on a routine patrol along the Ho River Trail, an easy five-mile loop popular with day hikers. Late summer crowds had dwindled. I figured I might have the forest to myself. Should have known better than to get complacent out there. Always something waiting just beyond the edges of the marked trails, something old and watchful. The first sign something was off was the silence. Usually... Even on a quiet day, there's the bird song, the rustle of critters in the undergrowth. That afternoon, the forest was dead quiet, like every living thing had up and vanished, or was holding its breath. The hairs on the back of my neck prickled with that uneasy feeling you get when you're not top of the food chain anymore. About halfway through the loop, I came across the first signs of trouble. Not a body, thank God but a shredded backpack lying in the middle of the trail. Spilled gear everywhere, water bottle, granola bar wrappers, bits of torn clothing. Looked like someone, or something, had ripped through it in a frenzy. My hiker instincts went on high alert, but protocol demanded I investigate. Kneeling down, I sifted through the wreckage. It felt wrong somehow, invasive. Found a crumpled Washington State driver's license, female, early twenties. Heart sank. She couldn't have gotten far in the dense forest, not injured. Radio back to dispatch, gave a quick rundown possible injured hiker, needed assistance. I followed the faint tracks leading off the trail and into the undergrowth. The woods closed in, old-growth cedar and hemlock sunlight barely filtering through the canopy. Had to fight my way through tangled ferns and fallen branches. Kept calling out the woman's name, though it felt increasingly futile. That's when I saw it. Not the woman, but what had gotten to her pack. Movement off to my left, a flash of dark fur disappearing into the shadows. Too big to be a cougar, the wrong build. My blood ran cold. We didn't get many bear sightings this far west, 
none that matched the size of whatever that was. And then I found her, what was left of her, or rather, parts of her. It had been messy. Viscera splattered on the leaves, clothing hanging from branches in bloody shreds. Limbs, God, the way those limbs were broken, twisted at inhuman angles. I gagged, stumbled back, my ranger training momentarily deserting me in the face of such raw brutality. It was watching me, I knew it was. From somewhere in the shadowed tangle of the ancient forest, I felt eyes upon me. Not the calculating eyes of a predator sizing up its next meal, though. There was a malevolent intelligence there, a chilling awareness that sent a shiver down my spine far deeper than the damp forest air. Adrenaline and something close to primal terror surged through me. I turned and ran. Back at the main trail, I made a breathless, garbled report to dispatch. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig made me jump. Told them, large unknown creature, possible second victim was myself. They must have thought I'd cracked under the strain. I didn't know what else to call it, the thing that had done that, done that to her. Backup arrived at dusk season rangers, experienced woodsmen, and they looked as shaken as I felt when I led them off the trail to the carnage. Flashlights didn't pierce the gloom effectively. There was a heavy, oppressive feeling to the air, a sense of violation hanging over that spot even heavier than the stench of blood. It was gone, of course. Whatever it was, it had vanished into the vast heart of the rainforest. But it had left its mark behind. They didn't find any identifiable remains of the poor woman. Some scraps of flesh, barely enough for DNA confirmation. Whatever lurked in those woods, it was strong, smart, and terrifyingly efficient. The next weeks were a blur. Park officials shut down the area, but you can't close off an entire rainforest, not easily. They sent in a search team, wildlife specialists. Found some tracks, huge, misshapen, no match to anything in the field guides. A few blurry photos from their motion sensor cameras, dark shapes, hunched forms moving with impossible fluidity through the trees. Theories got thrown around, a rogue bear with some genetic deformity, a relic population of Sasquatch. Hell, half the time we joked because what else could you do when faced with the inexplicable? The higher-ups got tight-lipped, clamped down on leaks to the press. The whole incident got hushed up, explained away as a bear attack despite the unsettling inconsistencies. The whole river area reopened, but things never felt the same. It's like something was, awakened that day, deep in the mossy heart of the forest. Something old and wrathful. My name is Lucas Warren, and this happened to me in October of 2010. I was working as a ranger in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, been at it for a few years by then. Grew up round these parts, always felt at home in the woods. Sure, there are the usual hazards, bears, unpredictable weather, the occasional reckless hiker, but those had become routine risks to manage. It was early fall, and a couple of buddies, Dylan and Ryan, had come up to visit. We were all experienced hikers and had planned a multi-day trek along the Appalachian Trail. Nothing too extreme, just the three of us, a chance to unwind and catch up. You bring protection? Ryan had asked as we were packing. Of course, I scoffed, flashing the rifle slung over my shoulder. Mostly for show, never actually had to use it. We hit the trailhead mid-morning. The sky was clear, not a hint of the sudden storms the Smokies were known for. We set a brisk pace, the familiar rhythm of footsteps and easy chatter a welcome soundtrack. 
Dylan, the photographer of the group, darted around, snapping pictures of weathered signposts and bursts of colorful mushrooms peeking through fallen leaves. Slow down! We've got all the time in the world. I ribbed him, though I couldn't help but smile at his enthusiasm. That afternoon, we came across an odd sight, a campsite clearly abandoned in a hurry. The tent was half-collapsed, sleeping bags unrolled as if someone had bolted mid-setup. A half-eaten energy bar lay near an open backpack. No signs of violence, just a weird, uneasy feeling about the whole thing. They probably just bailed when they saw the weather report. Ryan shrugged, ever the voice of reason. But it didn't sit right with me. Experienced campers don't just up and vanish. We opted to push on, figuring we'd report the abandoned campsite to the backcountry office in the morning. After another mile or so, we found a clearing and made camp for the night. It was a quiet evening. We cooked over a small fire, recounted old stories, and the usual good-natured ribbing. As night fell, the sense of unease lingered, a prickling at the back of my neck I couldn't shake. The chill woke me up sometime in the early hours of the morning. I lay still, senses on high alert. It wasn't the cold that had roused me. There was a rustling outside the tent, too rhythmic to be just the wind. Dylan stirred beside me, muttering sleepily. Something's out there, I whispered. His eyes shot open. We laid motionless, straining to hear over the thumping of my pulse. There it was again, a low, guttural growl. It made the hair on my arms stand on end. It was no bear, or at least, no bear I'd ever encountered. Next to me, Dylan fumbled for his phone, his fingers shaking. My hand tightened around the hunting knife at my hip. It felt comically inadequate. Ryan had unzipped the tent flap, his head poking out as he scanned the darkness. Lucas, what the— He froze, and with a sickening jolt, I knew why. Two piercing yellow eyes gleamed back at us from just beyond the firelight. They blinked, slow and deliberate, before vanishing into the blackness. Get back in! I hissed, but it was too late. Ryan was on his feet— scrambling backward in a panic. With a roar that sent chills down my spine, the creature emerged from the darkness. It was massive. A towering figure of matted fur and impossibly long limbs, moving with a fluid, terrifying grace. Its eyes, those inhuman, glowing eyes, were fixed on us. The rifle! I yelled at Ryan, but his face was a mask of terror. Another roar, deafening this time, and the creature lunged. I shoved Ryan back inside the tent, fumbling for the rifle with shaking hands. I barely raised it before the creature's claws ripped through the thin nylon, the swipe narrowly missing my face. Dylan screamed, a high-pitched desperate sound cut abruptly short. From inside the tent came the sound of tearing fabric, frenzied snarls and gut-wrenching thumps I'll never be able to forget. My rifle, useless now, clattered to the ground. Every survival instinct in me screamed to flee. Ryan was already tearing off into the darkness, his cries growing fainter. And beneath it all, Dylan's awful silence. I turned and ran, the creature's roar echoing behind me. It didn't pursue perhaps deterred by the remnants of the fire, perhaps savoring its catch. I ran blind, branches whipping my face, my boots sinking into the mushy forest floor. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs buckled beneath me. Only then, gasping for breath and soaked in cold sweat, did I dare to stop. Lost, alone, and hunted. The realization hit me like a physical blow. I hunkered down in the undergrowth, heart drumming a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Around me, the once familiar woods seemed hostile, 
teeming with unseen horrors. With every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, I flinched, half expecting those glowing eyes to pierce the gloom. The first rays of dawn painted the forest in an eerie gray light. I moved then, stumbling through the trees in the vague direction of the trail. If I was lucky, I might reach the ranger station by nightfall. If I was lucky, something shifted just ahead, a flicker of movement in the dense foliage. My battered muscles tensed, ready to run, to fight, to do anything but stand frozen in place. A weathered park signpost emerged from the tangle of branches. I'd stumbled across a lesser-known backcountry trail. My ragged breath turned into a sob of relief. I wasn't hopelessly lost. But still, that sense of being watched lingered. I forced myself to move faster, to not look back. It was hours later when I broke free of the treeline, the sight of the ranger station a beacon of hope. I burst through the doors, my mud-caked clothing and wild eyes drawing startled looks. The tail spilled out in a jumbled rush the creature, Dylan Ryan. Search and rescue teams were sent out within the hour. They scoured the woods for days. No trace of Ryan was ever found. No trace of Dylan, except for a scrap of blood-stained blue fabric snagged on a branch near the campsite. And what the search team did find, well, they were tight-lipped about it. Only said it confirmed my story, confirmed what I already knew with bone-deep certainty. My name is Rick, and this happened to me in the summer of 1994. I worked long-haul routes as a truck driver, which meant nights alone on the road, a lot of coffee, and a lot of sameness. Some guys complained, but I found something reassuring about the steady thrum of my rig, the black ribbon of road disappearing beneath the wheels, mile markers ticking by. I was on the last week of a three-week haul through the American Southwest, Phoenix to El Paso, El Paso down into Louisiana, then cutting west before finally swinging back north up into the Rockies where I'd get routed back to the main terminal in Utah. The desert was on my left, mile after mile of scrubland under the pitiless sun. The AC in my cab barely managed to keep the sweat from trickling unpleasantly down my spine. Ahead, shimmering in the heat, was a sign for gas and a truck stop, a welcome sight. I'd need to top up my tank and maybe grab a bite, or at least use the restroom in a building more substantial than the fiberglass shell on my rig. I signaled, and the truck lumbered across the cracked asphalt of the exit lanes and into the lot. The place looked abandoned, faded paint, a sagging roofline, cracked concrete in the parking area. Even the tumbleweeds seemed to have given this place a wide berth. Probably another victim of the interstate, I thought, pulling to a stop beside the pumps. I climbed out, the heat like a slap across the face. The stillness of the air was unnerving, no hum of traffic from the freeway, not even a hint of a breeze. After fueling, I headed inside. The silence grew more oppressive. Inside, the shop was deserted, no cashier behind the grimy counter, only a faint stench of something gone bad and the buzzing of flies around the hot dog warming under its glass dome. I walked around, peering down aisles lined with dusty products and sun-bleached magazines. A prickle of unease itched at the base of my neck. Hello? I called out. No response. Something wasn't right. I decided to cut my losses, heading back to the door. As I passed the counter, a flicker of movement near the magazine rack caught my eye. Maybe this place wasn't so deserted after all. From my angle, I couldn't make out its shape, just something thin and hunched on the floor, like a large, discarded sack. 
It twitched suddenly, a movement that was way too jerky to be natural. A chill ran down my spine. Then it lifted its head, and I froze. The face that stared back was a nightmare. It was human vaguely, but twisted and gaunt. Hollow eyes, skin stretched tight across bone, like a corpse left to dry in the desert. It bared its teeth, uneven fragments in a lipless mouth, and let out a rasping hiss. I didn't stick around. I bolted for the door, slamming into it frantically. The lock was rusted, unyielding. I pounded on the glass, yelling for help, but outside stretched only that empty expanse of sunblasted lot. Then I heard the scratch of movement behind me and spun around. It was crawling towards me, dragging itself over the linoleum with unexpected speed. Those vacant eyes were fixed on mine, and I swore something resembling hunger lurked in them. I scrambled backward, eyes flashing to the counter where an ancient-looking tire iron rested. It was a long shot, but I grabbed it, brandishing it like a weapon. The thing kept coming, hissing, the sound a grotesque parody of a snake. I swung the tire iron blindly, more out of desperation than strategy. It connected, the dull thunk sickening, but the creature hardly seemed to notice. I swung again, and again, driving it back, and then I was through the door and sprinting across the lot. My keys! I'd left them inside. I spun in a circle, heart pounding like a jackhammer. No other vehicles in sight, just this desolate, abandoned place and whatever the hell that thing was. I ran for my rig, fumbled the key into the lock, and swung myself into the cab. I slammed the door and locked it, fumbling with the ignition. My sweaty fingers slipped on the key twice before it finally turned. The engine roared to life and I threw it into gear, tires spitting gravel as I sped off towards the freeway. In the rearview mirror, the truck stopped dwindled. I didn't stop, didn't slow down, until I'd crossed the state line and was well into the night. I finally pulled over at a proper rest stop, breathing ragged. I climbed out and vomited on the gravel, shaking and cold despite the residual heat of day. I never went back to that place, never looked it up on a map, never even spoke a word about it. To this day, I don't know what I saw. I don't know if it was real. Maybe a hallucination brought on by too many nights staring at the road. Too much loneliness and caffeine. Maybe something else, something the rational mind rejects. Either way, sometimes when I'm on a stretch of empty road... My gaze lingers on the exits, those lonely outposts promising food and fuel and a break from the monotony. And a part of me remembers that parched truck stop, that crawling shape with its hungry eyes, and wonders just what else might be lurking out there in the vastness of the American desert. My name's Ray, and this happened to me back in 1998. I'm a long-haul trucker, always have been. My wife hates me being gone so much, but the bills gotta get paid, right? Mostly I keep to myself. On the road that long, you see a lot of the country, and a fair bit you'd rather not. That spring, I was hauling a load down to Texas, the kind of run that puts your backside to sleep and makes your eyeballs feel like they're covered in sand. I figured I'd push through the night, grab some sleep near Austin in the morning. Somewhere in northwest Louisiana, about two in the morning, I came up on a stretch of empty two-lane highway. Not much out there but swampland and pine trees. That's when I saw the headlights behind me. It was a big truck, the kind they use in the oil fields, with enough off-road lighting to make the sun jealous. I'm not a competitive sort, but whoever was driving the thing was riding my bumper, high beams glaring in my mirrors. I sped up a little to make room. 
The headlights dropped back, like the truck had passed. A few minutes later, they reappeared right behind me. I couldn't see a cab, or even a trailer behind those blinding high beams. What kind of idiot rides with? Something slammed into the back of my rig. I swerved, barely keeping the truck on the road. Red and blue lights suddenly flashed in my rearview and a siren blared, the kind the cops use. I eased the truck onto the shoulder and pulled the brake. Whoever was behind me passed on the left, those huge off-road lights swamping me in white. My heart pounded in my chest like a trapped bird. Just some yahoo messing around, I told myself. Probably drunk. But as the truck thundered away, I didn't see any taillights fading down the road. Just darkness. That's when the radio crackled. A low, raspy voice, not even coming from the CB, like it was right in my ear. Bad boy, speeding in my forest. My blood ran cold. I spun around, staring out into the black trees. No one there. I snatched up my mic. Who the hell? The voice rasped again on the radio. You owe me, bad boy. Get lost, free show, I said, forcing my voice to stay even. I threw the truck in gear and rolled out. A mile down the road, I looked in the mirror. No one behind me. Relieved, I let out a shaky breath. Then I saw them. Two pairs of headlights burning in the trees at the edge of the road, following me. I pushed the truck faster, the pines whipping by. But the lights in the trees kept pace. I snatched the CB again, shouting for help, anyone. But there was just static. Like I was the only one on the whole damn highway. I glanced back, more lights in the trees now. A dozen, maybe. Some of them weren't headlights. Greenish pinpricks of light, blinking in and out of the shadows, way too high off the ground for any vehicle. I fumbled for my phone, but it buzzed in my hand, the screen gone dark. Dead. Up ahead, I saw a break in the trees. An exit. Civilization. I jammed on the brakes, swerving onto the off-ramp, the truck leaning dangerously. It was gravel, barely more than a track, twisting off through the trees. Headlights flared behind me. The voice blared in my ear. You can't run, bad boy. Nowhere to hide. The off-ramp was narrow, my big rig bucking and struggling. But I had to try. I was going too fast bouncing across ruts and potholes. I spotted a clearing ahead, a faint glow of light. Hope flared in my chest. Somebody's house. Maybe I can get help. I hit the clearing at top speed, the trailer swaying violently, and the world seemed to tilt. It wasn't a house out there. It was a drilling rig. Floodlights painted it white, stark against the night sky. There was no one around, just the rig towering over some kind of open pit in the ground. I slammed the brakes, but the truck skidded on the loose gravel. It plowed right toward the edge of that pit. It was huge, the bottom lost in the dark. The reek of sulfur and something else foul drifted up. With a lurch and a screech, the trailer toppled over the edge. The tractor cab tipped after headlights pointing straight down into the pit. I fell hard against the seatbelt. Time slowed. I thought about my wife, thought about my girl. Then I was falling. Down, down, down. The cab jerked and swayed, and I braced myself for the final impact. I hit hard, glass and metal exploding around me. The world spun into blackness, I came to choking on dust. I was still alive, but pinned under the crumpled remains of the cab. Pain flared in my leg, sharp and sickening. I thrashed uselessly, trying to free myself. The rig groaned above me, metal shifting, 
threatening to give way entirely and crush me. I blinked back tears. Think, damn it, think. I strained my ears for any sound of help, but there was only the drip of fuel from the ruptured tank and the distant howl of what might have been a coyote. Out the broken windshield, the bottom of the pit was still shrouded in darkness. I saw no way to crawl out in this direction. I could only hope someone would find me before the leaking gas ignited. My eyes fell on a metal case under the passenger's seat. Emergency flares. Grunting with the effort, I twisted and wriggled, my pinned legs screaming in protest. Reaching under the seat, my fingers scraped across the rough metal. I fumbled the case free and struggled to open it, one hand useless. Finally, the lid popped open. I grabbed a flare, the rough texture of the fuse tape sharp against my skin. Twisting it, the flare sputtered to life, casting a harsh red glow on the mangled cab. My heart sank. I was too low to be seen from the road. But even if I wasn't, who would stop for a wrecked truck? Not anyone who'd heard that voice on the radio. Not anyone who had seen those lights in the trees. I had to climb out. With a desperate surge of adrenaline, I shoved against the wreckage overhead. The cab creaked, and hot metal dug into my shoulder. Gritting my teeth, I pushed again, harder. Nothing. The flare hissed, and I scrambled frantically. Grabbing the second flare, I twisted it, the red glow brighter this time throwing my frantic silhouette into stark relief. I waved the flares over my head, shouting myself hoarse, the words echoing uselessly into the pit. A new sound cut through my screaming, a rhythmic thumping, low and resonant. It was coming from below, from the pit itself. I froze, the flares still burning in my hands. The thumping grew louder. Suddenly, the earth under me gave way. Gravel and chunks of torn road tumbled past, swallowed by the darkness below. I clung to the steering wheel, panic rising like bile in my throat. Then I was sliding, half-falling, landing hard on a slope of loose dirt. I scrambled back, away from the edge, the flares rolling from my grasp. Darkness closed in, except for one pale green light. I spun around, and my breath caught. It was an eye. Larger than a dinner plate, glowing in the dark like a radioactive cat's eye. Below it, something vast and slick moved, a flash of scales in the dimness. The stink that rose from the pit was overwhelming now. Rotted eggs and something sweetly, sickeningly wrong. Another glowing eye opened below the first. Then the entire pit seemed to light up with dozens of smaller eyes. The creature, whatever it was, was rising. I fumbled backward, my hands scrabbling in the dirt. The ground vibrated under me, and the first of the glowing eyes rose above the rim of the pit, followed by a massive, mottled head. The creature didn't roar. Its gaping moss seemed too wide to make a sound. Instead, it released a piercing hiss that shook me to my bones. My ears rang, and my nose burned with the sulfurous stench of its breath. Terror turned to a numb, mindless determination. I scrambled to my feet and ran, blindly, stumbling over the jagged terrain. I heard the thump and hiss of its pursuit, gaining on me. Ahead, the pit wall loomed, impossibly high. Branches scraped at my face, tearing into my skin, but I hardly felt the pain. I leapt at the wall, clawing desperately for purchase, and found a rough root. Hauling myself upward, I heard the creature bellow in frustration below. I climbed, sobbing and gasping, until I reached the rim. Without a glance back, I launched myself into the trees and ran. I don't know how long I ran. I fell, got up, stumbled onwards, thorns tearing at my clothes, my lungs burning. 
It seemed an eternity before I collapsed in a tangle of ferns, unable to go further. Hours later, the sun filtered through the trees, dappling the ground with weak light. I heard the distant rumbling of trucks on the highway. Relief washed over me, then something else, shame. I couldn't tell that story. No one would believe me. I stayed hidden until dark, then stumbled back to the road. By sheer luck, a trucker stopped for me. When he asked about the wreck, I told him I'd swerved to avoid an animal and gone over a bank. The story made the local papers. Trucker survives highway accident. There was no mention of oil rigs, or pits, or glowing eyes. Sometimes, when I think no one is listening, I whisper the truth out loud, over and over, until the words lose all meaning. I've seen things no one is meant to see. Sometimes I wonder if I really got away, or if whatever was down there in that pit is simply waiting. I try to push the thought down. After that, I quit long-haul trucking. My wife is happy, but still gives me that look sometimes. She knows something changed in me out there in those Louisiana swamps. It's in my eyes when I see too much darkness, in the way I jump at shadows that move just a bit too fast. Because something followed me back that night. Something I'll never be entirely free of, no matter how far I run. My name is Everett Klein, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2008. Married for almost 18 years, two daughters, a mortgage, I'm your average Joe. Long-haul trucking keeps food on the table, but it's a lonely existence. Still, the open road has its pull and beats punching a clock in some factory. That particular run took me from Seattle down to southern Arizona, right along the border. I'd never driven this route before, and that stretch of interstate slicing through the Arizona desert takes bleak to a whole new level. It was late October, the days already crisp. I planned to spend the night in Flagstaff, maybe catch a few winks before pushing on to Phoenix. Around dusk, I rolled into a dusty gas station just south of Payson, Arizona one of those old-school places with a rusting sign and faded pumps. The guy working the counter, all scrawny neck and grease-stained overalls, eyed me as I filled up my tank, gave me a head nod and a place is slowing down for the night, which, translated, meant he'd be locking the doors soon. Figuring I could use a stretch and a hot meal, I pulled the truck around the back where there was a little diner attached to the station. Stepping inside, it felt like I'd walked into a different era. Worn vinyl booths, a cracked linoleum floor, the smell of stale coffee and fried food, it hit a nostalgic chord, reminded me of truck stops back when I was a kid riding with my dad. There were only a few other folks inside. An old couple hunched over their plates, a guy with a trucker hat and a worn denim jacket perched at the counter, twirling a toothpick between his teeth. I took an empty booth, and a waitress appeared almost immediately, her name tag reading Flo Middle-Aged, frizzy hair, and a resigned look in her eyes. "'What'll it be, honey?' she asked in a voice thick with years of cigarette smoke. I scanned the laminated menu. Meatloaf sounds good. Side of hash browns and a coffee black, if you please, I said. She jotted the order down on a notepad as I took in the scene. This place had a strange vibe to it, something off that I couldn't quite put my finger on. The other customers seemed frozen in time, the lighting dim. It was like a still photograph and I just didn't belong in it. Then, I caught sight of something in a grimy mirror behind the counter. A flicker of movement outside. A dark figure was lurking in the parking lot close to my truck. The figure crouched, 
peering into my truck's cab for just a moment before disappearing back into the shadows. A chill ran down my spine. Someone casing out my rig. But there hadn't been any other trucks at the gas station, and the place was out in the middle of nowhere. Who would be interested in what I was hauling? A nagging unease settled upon me. My meatloaf arrived, steaming, along with a chipped mug of coffee. I took a sip, but my stomach churned with nerves. Something wasn't right with this whole situation. I needed to get back on the highway, away from this place and whoever had been watching me. Check, please. I called out, tossing a few bills onto the table. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the trucker at the counter get up. He caught my gaze and nodded in the direction of the door. Leaving already? Flo asked with a cocked eyebrow as I passed. Got a long night ahead, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. Outside, the air hung heavy, the silence pressing against my eardrums. Where had that figure gone? The trucker from the diner leaned against his rig, lighting a cigarette. I gave him a tense nod as I approached my truck. Before sliding into the driver's seat, I did a quick scan of the area. Empty lot, just a tumbleweed blowing across the cracked asphalt. Whatever unease gripped me, I pushed it down. It was likely just an oddball, maybe a local homeless guy. No reason to spook myself. As I climbed into the cab and flipped on the headlights, a sudden, sharp pain jolted through my foot. I yelped and looked down. There, embedded in the sole of my boot, was a shard of glass, glinting in the dim light. I swore under my breath and fumbled to pull the sliver out. My skin prickled, the feeling of being watched intensifying. It took me a moment to clear the glass from my soul, my fingers shaking slightly. That's when I saw the trucker again. He stood by his truck now, watching me intently. In the harsh glare of my headlights, he looked different, his features more angular, less human. His eyes held a strange intensity, unblinking. Then he gestured, motioning for me to follow. A wave of fear crashed over me. I'd seen his truck here earlier, figured he was just another driver passing through. But now, something about him was wrong. Survival instincts kicked in. I threw the truck into gear and peeled out of the gravel lot, the roar of the engine shattering the silence. Glancing in the rearview mirror, I saw the trucker's rig lurch forward in pursuit, headlights blazing in the desolate night. The adrenaline surged through me like an electric current as I pushed the truck to its limits. My heart hammered a frantic rhythm against my ribs, my vision narrowing to the stretch of highway illuminated ahead. Every jolt and rattle of my truck felt as if that relentless figure was one step closer. I had no idea where I was going, only that I had to get away. Images flashed across my mind, my wife, my girls, and the life I was desperately trying to get back to. Glancing in my side mirrors, the relentless headlights of his truck closed in, gaining with each passing mile. He knew this terrain, these desolate stretches of road, far better than I did. In this deadly chase, I was outmatched, and he knew it. Then up ahead I saw a glimmer of hope, a signpost indicating a dirt road cutting off from the highway. A potential escape route. With a desperate twist of the wheel, I veered off the main road, bouncing and jolting across the rough terrain. Dust choked the air, blurring my view. Every dip and bump threatened to send the truck careening out of control. The unrelenting beam of his headlights remained behind me, but dimmed slightly. Maybe, just maybe, I was gaining a small advantage. That hope was brutally extinguished when I saw the ravine looming before me. I slammed the brakes, tires screeching against dirt and rock. The truck skidded, 
then careened to a halt a mere foot from the sheer drop-off. I sat there, gasping for air, my heart pounding a deafening beat in my ears. The sound of his truck grew closer. There was nowhere left to run. The driver's side door creaked open, and an overpowering stench washed over me, rotting meat mixed with something oily and metallic. My stomach revolted. I could hear heavy footsteps approaching as his figure stepped into the hazy pool of light cast by my headlights. He was tall, inhumanly tall, and lean with a wiry, muscular build. Filthy clothes hung off his gaunt frame, ripped in places to reveal grayish skin stretched taut over prominent bones. His face, that's what made my breath catch in my throat. Sunken cheeks, an emaciated jawline, yet his eyes bulged, filled with a predatory hunger. His lips were pulled back in a grotesque snarl, revealing a row of needle-like teeth, stained dark crimson. He lunged at me, and I recoiled, throwing up a desperate arm as he grabbed my shoulder. His grip was like iron. With a sickening ripping sound, my jacket tore. I struggled against him, his breath hot and rancid on my face. There was a flash of movement. Had he brought something with him? A blade, some weapon? Then a searing pain shot through my leg. I screamed and kicked blindly, finally connecting. He staggered back, clutching at his face. My chance. I scrambled out of the driver's seat and onto the dirt, half crawling, half stumbling towards the edge of the ravine. It was pitch black beyond the drop. I couldn't see where I was going, but it didn't matter. Anywhere was better than remaining in his clutches. A guttural growl echoed behind me as he regained his footing. I took a leap of faith and plunged into the abyss. The fall was brutal, a sickening mix of terror and tumbling blackness. Sharp rocks tore at my clothes, my skin. I braced for the inevitable impact that would splinter my bones, but the landing was cushioned by a tangle of dry brush. Still, the force knocked the wind from my lungs. Pain exploded through me as I tried to move, my leg twisted at an unnatural angle, nausea rising in my throat. It was broken, maybe worse. But I forced myself to crawl, dragging my mangled body through the dirt, every inch in agony. His footsteps echoed above, closer with each ragged breath I took. He'd find me soon enough, cornered like an animal. A sob tore from my throat. My girls would never see their dad again. Then I saw it, an outcropping of rock jutting from the ravine wall, forming a small, shadowy alcove. Desperation fueled me. I reached for a handhold, pulling myself up and into the crevice, shoving myself as far back as I could go. I curled into a ball, willing myself to disappear into the darkness. The footsteps stopped right above my hiding spot. He was there, breathing in ragged, frustrated pants. He knew I was close. I held my breath, tears streaming silently down my face. He started muttering to himself, his voice a chilling, guttural rasp. Words I didn't understand, but the tone was enough to send shivers down my spine. Then, a thud something heavy being dragged. A sickening wave of terror washed over me as I realized what he planned. I watched in horror as the bloodied bodies of the couple from the diner were tossed over the edge, landing with dull thumps below. My stomach heaved. He would do the same with me if he found me. The shuffling footsteps faded. Then, a low, rasping chuckle echoed off the ravine walls making my blood run cold. He knew I was still out here somewhere. He was toying with me, waiting, savoring the hunt. The night stretched on endlessly. I drifted in and out of a painful stupor, the image of his monstrous form burned behind my eyelids. Morning painted the sky with pale light, and still, 
There was no sign of him. I waited for what felt like an eternity, every muscle tensed for the onslaught that never came. Inch by painful inch, I dragged myself out of my hiding place, the harsh daylight a brutal reminder of my plight. I don't remember much about what came next. The miles I crawled along the ravine, the eventual stumbling upon a remote road, the kind stranger who stopped their car at the sight of a bloodied, broken man, the events blurred together. The police came, the statements at the hospital, the faces of my wife and daughter streaked with tears. Reporters latched onto the story, dubbing him the Desert Ripper. They never found him. The incident irrevocably altered me, chipped away at the ordinary life I once led. The physical scars healed, but the nightmares linger. The endless stretch of deserted highway, his gaunt figure stalking me under the relentless desert sun. I'll never be the same easygoing trucker again. The fear sits in my gut, a permanent resident. Some nights, I think I hear the rumble of a truck engine outside, smell the rotting stench that clung to him. I wake in a cold sweat, my heart pounding, wondering if he's finally come back for me to finish the hunt he'd started on that desolate stretch of highway. This happened to me on July 4, 1994, just outside the small town of Willow Creek, California. A place mostly known for its logging industry and the legend of Bigfoot. Most folks around here don't take any of that seriously. I sure didn't. My name's Deputy Russell Cobb. I've been with the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office for about seven years now. I'm a family man got a wife and two young daughters. We moved to Willow Creek for the quiet life, or at least that's what I hoped for. It was a warm evening, a typical California summer. We were having a backyard barbecue with some friends and neighbors. Their kids were playing tag with mine. It was the perfect picture of small-town life laughter, the smell of grilled burgers, and the sun starting to dip below the redwood trees. Around 8 p.m., our dispatcher got a call about a disturbance over on Route 299, near the edge of the Six Rivers National Forest. Something about a fight breaking out at one of those roadside campsite pull-offs. With most of the deputies on the holiday shift or helping with the fireworks show down in town, I was the closest unit available. Now... These calls can be anything from a couple of drunk campers getting rowdy to a full-blown domestic dispute. But something in the dispatcher's voice made me uneasy. There was an edge of fear there, a tremor I hadn't heard before. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was more than just your average campground brawl. As soon as I turned on to Route 299, I knew something was wrong. The campsite pull-offs were usually packed with trailers and cars, especially on a holiday weekend. But tonight, it was deserted. An eerie silence hung in the air. Driving a bit further, I saw it, an overturned camper van, smashed practically to pieces. The doors hung open, and camping gear was scattered all over the road. It was like a bomb went off. I pulled over and grabbed my flashlight, a knot of dread forming in my stomach. Approaching cautiously, I surveyed the scene. There were blood stains near the van and drag marks leading into the woods. It looked like someone, or something, had been pulled off into the trees. This wasn't a fist fight. This was something else entirely. I called for backup on my radio but the signal was patchy out here in the woods. All I heard was static. Cursing, I decided to investigate further, relying on my instincts. Before heading into the woods, I grabbed my shotgun from the trunk of the cruiser. Best to be prepared. My flashlight beam cut through the dense foliage. The ground was uneven, covered in roots and rocks. 
I followed the drag marks for what felt like a mile, weaving deeper into the forest. My heart hammered in my chest as the air grew thick with the smell of pine and something sharp and metallic. Blood. Then I heard it, a rustling sound up ahead, followed by a low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. I raised my shotgun and flicked off the safety, scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. Suddenly, a pair of glowing yellow eyes pierced the darkness. They were positioned low to the ground, about thirty feet away. The creature was massive, easily seven feet tall when it reared up on its hind legs. I could make out its hulking form, covered in coarse, dark fur. It resembled a bear in some ways, but its proportions were off, its limbs too long and powerful. What the hell was this thing? Before I could get a better look, the creature charged. It moved with shocking speed for its size, barreling through the undergrowth like it was nothing. I fired off a shot, more out of panic than anything else. The blast echoed through the trees, and the creature staggered back, roaring in pain. I didn't wait around to see if I had seriously hurt it. I turned and ran, my lungs burning as I stumbled back through the darkness towards the road. My mind raced. Was this some kind of deformed bear? A genetic anomaly? Or was it something else, something the local lore had hinted at for decades? The crashing sounds behind me got closer. Sweat dripped down my forehead as I sprinted, the flashlight beam bouncing wildly. The creature's snorts and the pounding of its feet felt like they were right at my heels. Just when I thought I was about to be run down, I broke through the tree lean and saw my cruiser. Hope surged through me. I fumbled with the keys, my fingers shaking. I managed to unlock the door and dive inside, slamming it shut just as the creature emerged from the woods. It slammed its huge paws against the cruiser, rocking the vehicle violently. I could see its massive claws and its fangs bared in a snarl that sent shivers down my spine. I started the engine and threw the car into reverse, slamming my foot on the gas. The cruiser lurched backward, and I tore down the road, the creature briefly illuminated in my rearview mirror as it chased after me. For a terrifying moment, I thought it might catch up, but slowly, the headlights began to outpace it. By the time I reached open ground, the creature was just a dark shadow swallowed by the woods. I radioed for help again, my voice hoarse. This time, the signal cut through, and I choked out a panicked description of what happened and my location. Within fifteen minutes, backup arrived, three cruisers, lights flashing, and a couple of officers from fish and wildlife. We went back to the campsite and into the woods armed with rifles and high-powered spotlights. We scoured the area but the creature was long gone, leaving only overturned earth and the lingering stench of something feral and wild. The officers questioned me, disbelief lacing their voices. I described the creature as best I could, the sheer size of it, the way it moved they exchanged uneasy glances. The fish and wildlife guys took some casts of the huge clawed footprints we found. They couldn't identify them, muttering about how they didn't match any known predator in the area. In the days that followed, the incident sent shockwaves through Willow Creek. The official report listed it as a bear attack, but everyone knew it was something more. Old-timers, the type who'd usually talk about little besides logging and fishing, started muttering about Bigfoot, about things their grandfathers had seen in those woods. Hikers and campers steered clear of the area, fear hanging heavy in the air. And me? Well, let's just say I didn't sleep much. The incident changed me, shattered my simple understanding of the world. There was no going back to barbecues and small-town complacency. I became obsessed with finding out what the creature was. Was it alone? 
Were there more like it out there? I requested a leave of absence from the sheriff's office and spent every waking hour scouring the woods and researching local lore. One evening, I stumbled upon a small, dusty bookshop in town. The grizzled old man behind the counter listened patiently to my story, a skeptical glint in his eye. Then, after rummaging through some boxes, he handed me a leather-bound book, its pages yellowed with age. It was a collection of local legends and first-hand accounts dating back to the gold rush days. There were stories that mirrored my experience, descriptions of a huge, shadowy creature that stalked the forests. The old man explained that the Native American tribes of the region had long believed in a protector spirit of the forest, a creature known as Omaha, or Boss of the Woods. Could this thing, this Omaha, truly be real? The thought was both terrifying and absurd. I started hiking deeper into the forest, trying to observe, to understand. I set up motion-activated trail cameras, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. Weeks turned into months, and sightings of the creature became more frequent. Some folks swore they had seen it near their homes, a hulking shadow moving through the trees. Others heard strange, unearthly howls in the night, echoing across the valley. Fear festered in Willow Creek. People locked their doors at night, ventured out armed, and the once lively tourist trade dried up. The town was on edge, teetering on the brink of mass hysteria. One morning, I got a call to investigate a gruesome discovery on a farmer's property at the edge of the forest. A mutilated cow carcass, torn apart with a savagery that no bear or mountain lion could inflict. Standing there, looking at what remained of the animal, I was certain the creature was responsible. This couldn't continue. One night, driven by a mix of fear, desperation, and a strange sense of duty, I gathered a group of trusted friends hunters, ex-military guys, people tough enough to handle themselves in the woods. We armed ourselves and set off into the forest, determined to track down the creature. It was a foolhardy move, I knew, born out of a need to confront the thing that had so radically altered all of our lives. We spent days combing the forest. Morale dwindled with every false alarm and dead-end trail. Then, one evening as the sun was setting, the smell hit us that unmistakable stench of blood and musk. We followed the scent cautiously, our senses on high alert. We found ourselves in a clearing, and there it was. The creature stood in the center, its back towards us, hunched over the body of a freshly killed deer. In that moment, time seemed to slow down. Every detail etched itself into my memory, the moonlight glinting off its coarse fur, the powerful muscles rippling beneath its skin, the sheer unnatural size of the thing. Before anyone could react, it whirled around, yellow eyes glowing with a feral intelligence. It roared, a deafening sound that seemed to shake the very ground beneath our feet. One of the guys, a hot-headed former Marine named Carter, opened fire. The rest of us followed suit, the gunshots shattering the silence of the forest. The creature bellowed in pain and rage, stumbling but not falling. It charged towards our position, a wave of black fur and teeth. We fired until our rifles clicked empty, but the creature seemed impervious to bullets. It barreled into us, sending men flying like ragdolls. Chaos erupted. I saw Carter grapple with the beast, screaming as its claws tore into him. In desperation, I grabbed a fallen branch, its end sharpened, and charged. More of an act of blind panic than bravery. I lunged at the creature, the makeshift spear sinking into its flank. It howled and turned its attention to me. I don't remember much after that. A crushing blow sent me flying. The world spun into darkness. I regained consciousness slowly, a dull ache throbbing in my head. 
groaning I opened my eyes. I was lying on the forest floor, battered and bruised. The creature was gone. Scattered around me were my companions, some wounded, some still. Carter was gone, a smear of blood the only sign that he had been there. It took us hours to make our way out of the woods as the first rays of dawn broke through the trees. We carried the injured and the dead. What remained of our expedition was a shambling procession of broken men, haunted by the events of the night before. In the aftermath, Willow Creek was a changed town. The creature, whatever it was, became an unspoken presence, a dark secret woven into the fabric of the place. Some folks left, unable to shake the fear. Others, like me, stayed. I returned to the sheriff's office, forever altered by my experience. I filed a report, a heavily edited version of the truth. Officially, Carter and the others who perished that night were killed in a hunting accident. In the years that followed, there were occasional sightings of the creature— fleeting glimpses in the shadows of the forest. People still go missing around here sometimes, disappearances attributed to bears or mountain lions. But those of us who know, we understand that there's something else out there, something untamed and unknowable. I never returned to those woods, never went hunting again. The forest, once a place of solace, became a place of nightmares, Sometimes, late at night, I still think I see those blazing yellow eyes watching me from the darkness, a constant reminder of the wildness that lurks just beyond the edges of our understanding. This happened to me on June 19, 1995. Back then, I was still a rookie on the force in the sleepy little town of Ravenwood, perched amidst the rolling hills of Tennessee. You see, Ravenwood is the kind of place where folks leave their doors unlocked, where pie-baking contests are the hottest ticket in town. I'm Will Carter, a local boy made good, or so I thought. My wife Sarah and I just bought a fixer-upper with a view of the lake to raise our kids in the whole small-town American dream. The night it began, I was working late. One of those paperwork nights, sorting through incident reports at the station. The only sound was the ticking of the clock on the wall and the rain dripping down the windowpane. Around midnight, the phone rang, jolting me out of my half-doze. It was Martha Jenkins, old as the hills and twice as sharp. She said she'd heard gunshots and howling coming from over by the old Blackwood Place. Now, the Blackwood Place was one of those spots that sends shivers down your spine just looking at it, a crumbling Victorian mansion on the edge of town that had been abandoned for years. Rumors swirled about the old man who lived there, tales of strange experiments and unholy goings-on. I figured it was probably just kids messing around but the old lady was insistent. Sighing, I grabbed my flashlight and headed out, rain spitting in my face. I told myself it was just another routine call, just another false alarm. But as I neared Blackwood's sprawling grounds, my stomach started twisting, and I instinctively reached for the gun on my hip. The house was a hulking black shadow against the moonlit sky. A single dim light flickered in an upstairs window. I circled the house, the grounds eerily silent except for the steady drumming of rain. Then, from behind the house, I heard it, a howl that froze my blood. It wasn't like any animal I knew. Long, mournful, with a terrifying, almost human edge to it. I crept toward the sound, flashlight cutting a path through the darkness. That's when I saw the body, splayed out in the muddy drive, just outside the ring of trees that bordered the property, was a man. Even in the dim light, I could make out that his clothes were torn, his body mangled and twisted with unnatural force. 
It was an animal attack, not in the way I know it. It was methodical. I was kneeling beside the body, my mind racing, when a low growl echoed from the tree line. Slowly, my pulse pounding, I lifted the flashlight beam and illuminated the horrifying sight before me. The creature was tall, at least seven feet if it were standing fully upright, with long, powerful limbs. Its fur was a matted black, and its eyes burned like amber coals in the otherwise featureless darkness of its head. Its fangs were long and jagged, dripping with something that wasn't just water. It snarled, a guttural sound that reverberated through my bones, a display of both fury and predatory hunger. For a split second, we both froze. Then it lunged. I stumbled backwards, firing blindly. Bullets tore into the night, and the creature let out a roar of pain. I scrambled to reload, my hands fumbling, as it crashed through the trees, heading straight for me. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding a deafening rhythm, the flashlight beam dancing wildly. I saw the flash of its yellow eyes and the glint of its razor claws extended. Suddenly, the sound of approaching sirens shattered the night. Backup had arrived. The headlights of the cruisers spilled across the glade. The creature hesitated, thrown off balance by the interruption. And for a brief window, I had the upper hand. I aimed, my hand steady, and fired. I squeezed the trigger again and again, each bullet slamming into the creature. It shrieked, rearing back in pain, its movements becoming less fluid, more staggered. With a final, desperate shot, I hit it square in the chest. It stumbled, then turned and fled with surprising speed back into the woods, vanishing as if it were merely smoke. The other officers flooded the scene, guns drawn. But it was gone. There was no body, only the traces of blood and drag marks in the rain-soaked earth. Despite a thorough search of the grounds and the surrounding woods, we found nothing else. The rest, as they say, is a blur. The man's death was officially ruled an animal attack, though the local medical examiner confided in me that he'd never seen wounds like those in his entire career. Nobody believed my story of the creature, of course. Old Martha Jenkins, bless her, came the closest with her muttering about werewolves and Blackwood family curses. They chalked it up to PTSD, battle fatigue from an uneventful life. I'm on indefinite leave from the force pending a psychiatric evaluation. Sarah's eyes still hold terror when she looks at me, like she's waiting for me to finally snap. And at night, when the rain falls and the wind whispers in the old oaks, I still hear the echo of those howls just beyond the tree line. And I wonder... Did I really imagine what I saw that night? Or is it still out there, biding its time, waiting for another night when the moon is full and the good people of Ravenwood sleep soundly, unaware of the true terror prowling on their doorstep? This happened to me on February 18th, 1999. I was working as a deputy with the county sheriff's department in the little town of Havenwood nestled deep in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri. Life around here is peaceful. Most of my calls involve chasing stray chickens or settling feuds over property lines. Thought the biggest threat I'd face was boredom, but as always, life had a way of proving me wrong. It started with the Wallace family. The Wallaces were newcomers, city folk who bought up the old, abandoned Henderson farm on the outskirts of town. They kept to themselves mostly, but there were whispers, rumors they were into some kind of weird cult, that they were performing strange rituals out in the woods. Folks around here are God-fearing and suspicious of outsiders. Probably just harmless eccentrics, I figured. Then their son, Elijah, went running into town one night, 
terrified out of his mind. He was babbling something about monsters in the woods, about his parents being taken. The sheriff calmed him down, dismissed it as a nightmare, kid's overactive imagination or something. I wasn't so sure. There was something off about the look in that boy's eyes, a kind of primal terror that was hard to dismiss. The next morning, Sheriff Thompson sent me out to do a welfare check on the Wallace family. I drove out to their farm, the old logging road winding through thick forest. The place looked deserted, overgrown and neglected. I approached the farmhouse cautiously, something about the silence pricking at my nerves. That's when I saw the blood. It was smeared on the front porch, dark streaks leading into the house. The front door stood ajar, creaking slightly in the breeze. I called out, my voice echoing eerily into the empty house. No reply. Dread settling in the pit of my stomach, I drew my gun and pushed the door open. The sight that met my eyes was one I will carry with me to my grave. The living room was a scene of utter devastation. Furniture was overturned and smashed the walls spattered with blood. In the center of the room lay the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, or more accurately, what was left of them. Their corpses were torn and mutilated, the wounds ragged and unnatural. It looked like an animal attack, but deeper, more savage than anything I had ever witnessed. This was no mountain lion or rabid dog. Panic and nausea rose in my throat. I stumbled back outside, gasping for fresh air as I stumbled for my radio. My call to the sheriff was frantic, urgent. Backup arrived quickly, sirens shattering the rural tranquility. We searched the farm, scouring the surrounding woods. Found nothing but a few strange, oversized tracks in the soft earth near the tree lean and an oppressive sense of wrongness hanging in the air. The investigation that followed was a nightmare. The coroner couldn't determine the cause of death, the wounds unlike anything she'd seen. State wildlife experts were called in, but they were baffled too. Elijah Wallace vanished, the only witness gone. The townsfolk got spooked, their distrust of the Wallaces turning into outright fear. Whispers about dark forces, old curses, things lurking unseen in the woods filled the local tavern. Sheriff Thompson dismissed it all as nonsense, an animal attack or maybe some kind of occult ritual gone wrong. But I saw the carnage in that farmhouse, saw the look in those dead eyes. And deep down, a cold certainty grew in me that there was something monstrous out there in the vast expanse of the Ozarks. One moonlit night, about a month later, I was on patrol when I saw it. My cruiser's headlights cut through the thick fog, and for a heart-stopping moment, it was illuminated in the beams. A hulking form, hunched and distorted, standing on the edge of the road. It had the body of an ape, covered in thick, dark fur, but its head was elongated, lupin, crowned with a set of wicked horns. Its eyes, reflecting the headlights, burned with a chilling yellow light. For an instant, time seemed to freeze. Then, it lunged into the undergrowth, disappearing into the darkness with unnerving speed. I slammed on the brakes, the cruiser fishtailing to a stop. My heart pounded in my chest, and a cold sweat broke out on my brow. Hands shaking, I fumbled for my radio, my voice ragged as I reported the sighting to a disbelieving Sheriff Thompson. He wrote it off as stress, exhaustion, told me to go home, get some rest. But I couldn't rest. I knew what I saw. That night, I started my own investigation, poring over old maps, local legends, anything that might offer a clue about the creature lurking in the woods. I became obsessed driven by a mix of fear and determination. I couldn't let whatever was out there continue to terrorize the town. I was no longer just a deputy doing his job. 
This had become personal. One recurring name kept surfacing in the old stories. The Ozarkaler, a creature of local folklore said to haunt these hills. The descriptions varied, but they all shared common threads. A monstrous, horned beast, savage and bloodthirsty. Some legends even told of the Howler's ability to mimic human cries, drawing its prey into the shadows. Could this be what killed the Wallaces? What I saw on that foggy back road. Weeks turned into months. I spent my nights patrolling the woods, following any faint trail or rumor. My marriage crumbled. My friends thought I was going crazy. The whole town started to view me as the local loon, the deputy who saw monsters. I couldn't blame them. I started to doubt my own sanity sometimes. But that primal fear, the memory of that monstrous form, fueled me. I couldn't give up, even if it meant sacrificing everything. I stumbled upon something unsettling while exploring the dense forest near Pine Ridge Reservation, South Dakota. My name's Keevan Red Deer and I work as a ranger in this vast woodland. The quiet was disturbed by the distant sound of birds fleeing. Hiking a few miles off the trail, I found a grisly scene. A slaughtered deer sprawled across a creek, its limbs torn from its body, gnawed and thrown haphazardly. It was unlike any animal attack I had seen during my time as a ranger. I radioed for backup but received only static. It appeared that my remote location was causing interference. Unable to call for help, I scanned the area for clues. Muddy footprints led away from that gruesome sight toward a towering tree covered in deep gouges. With no clear answer to what had happened and feeling uneasy, I ventured further northwest into the forest. Even though I've been lonely out here after divorcing last year, the silence today felt menacing. My friend Al Flavio reached out with concern regarding his sister, Valenka, who had gone missing last week while hiking in these woods. Local authorities hadn't found any trace of her. The faint stench of decaying flesh intensified with each step. Approaching an abandoned cabin, long abandoned by some hopeful prospector, dread filled me as Valenka's favorite bright orange scarf laid on the weathered door just like she used to wear it around her neck. Before entering the cabin, bloody drag marks caught my eye leading from the door towards an inconspicuous hole. Adrenaline surged as I descended into darkness. Crawling along that narrow tunnel felt like an eternity. Suddenly faced with two tunnels branching off ahead of me, I chose left and emerged in a large open chamber. The air inside was stale and putrid evidence of death lingered heavily. Illuminated by my flashlight, the bones of Valenka and other victims scattered around that hellish secret lair. My heart pounded violently in my chest and a cold sweat traced a shivering path down my spine. This was not the work of an animal. In the darkness, I heard something approaching swiftly from behind. A menacing growl ricocheted throughout the chamber as a shadowy figure appeared. It revealed itself an upright, muscular creature, with an elongated wolf-like snout, gleaming yellow eyes, and long clawed hands. The figure sported thick black fur matted with blood and grime revealing patches of scarred flesh. My instincts were to run or fight, but neither option seemed promising. Wrestling for composure despite such fear, I decided to bluff for help by radioing. Keevan calling base! Creature sighted, sending location pin now! Need backup! Over! For what felt like minutes, I remained frozen in place staring at the monstrous creature that had been the cause of so much pain and suffering. Its heaving breaths echoed through the chamber, filling the space with an oppressive intensity. The creature seemed to be toying with me, 
studying me with its malicious yellow eyes as it slowly circled closer. Suddenly, a crackle erupted from my radio. Kevin, this is base. Back up en route. ETA five minutes. Over. The creature momentarily halted its advance, cocking its head in curiosity at the garbled noise. As it returned its focus to me, I seized the opportunity to scramble back into the narrow tunnel leading out of the chamber. The tight enclosure barely allowed any room for movement as I half-crawled and half-slid through a mad dance of survival. Behind me, the creature let out a furious roar and charged into the tunnel. Its great size hindered its movement in the cramped space, but it relentlessly pursued me, nonetheless snarling and snapping mere inches away from my feet. The exit finally appeared before me. I hastily clambered out of the hole and sprinted with all my remaining energy toward a cluster of trees nearby for cover. Behind me, I could hear the gut-wrenching sounds of tearing wood and ripping earth, as the creature attempted to force its way out of the confined tunnel. Moments later, my backup team arrived on site aboard an armored vehicle equipped for high-stakes rescue operations. As they took defensive positions around the cabin, their high-powered flashlights cast beams through the darkness, revealing their surroundings in stark clarity. Led by Captain Branson, they quickly spotted me crouched among the nearby trees just outside of their protective circle formed around the cabin entrance to apprehend whatever danger awaited them. Citrep! Branson commanded as he jogged over to drag me back behind their defensive line. His team aimed their weapons toward the hole in anticipation of what would emerge from its depths. Creature! Monster! Still coming! I wheezed out in a barely coherent sentence trying to catch my breath. With perfect timing, the creature finally burst through the tunnel and raged at the interference. Bullets riddled its massive form as Branson's team engaged it with unmatched accuracy. But the onslaught did little to deter the beast. Its resilience seemed unnatural. The team was forced to take evasive action as it lunged for one of our teammates tearing through precious defenses the team had set up. Seeing no other option left to turn the tide, Branson made a quick call on his radio for an air assist from our station chopper. Minutes later, an aerial assault plummeted from above, striking the creature repeatedly with a hailstorm of high-explosive rounds. Finally incapacitated by this devastating firestorm, it lay there, twisted and broken, heaving violently on the ground struggling to grasp its last dwindling breaths of life. The team cautiously approached with their weapons trained on it, ready to end it should it stir back into motion, but at long last it ceased to move. We stared at its mangled remains, unable to quite comprehend what we had just faced. Eventually, a scientist was brought in from headquarters to study this extraordinary find I couldn't help but overhear their whispered references about an old legend that used to run rampant deep within these woods causing residents and prospectors alike frightful nights where they did not know such a creature roamed. In the following weeks, there were solemn memorial services held honoring Valenka and all the other victims who had succumbed in that wretched chamber. Grief hung heavily over everyone who knew them, but simultaneously, there was an unspoken sense of collective relief that there would be no more victims now that this horror had come to an end. And as for me, I knew my life would never quite be the same again witnessing something so gruesome and otherworldly that it shook the very foundation of my beliefs. I now focus on rebuilding a life dedicated to combating these unknown terrors and others like it to ensure that no one else suffers at their hands. It all started when I joined a group of friends, including Jackson Fife and Arabella Dracott for a camping trip in the Big Thicket National Preserve in Texas. We hoped this weekend getaway would relieve the stresses of our mundane work lives. 
Little did we know that it would culminate in something we'd never forget. We pitched our tents and gathered around a crackling fire, sharing stories while feasting on beans and hot dogs. I reminisced about the time my father taught me how to build a fire from scratch, demonstrating the swift flick of the wrist needed for the perfect amount of friction, an invaluable skill that felt especially relevant now. During one of our conversations, Arabella paused and tilted her head toward a distant rustling sound. The foliage shifted as a creature slinked out from the brush, making its way to our campsite. "'What is that?' whispered Jackson, his expression horrified. The creature was unlike anything we had ever seen before. Its elongated limbs ended in sharp claws— and scaly skin covered its grotesquely twisted body. Terror gripped us as it emitted an ethereal, marrow-chilling howl that pierced the silent night. We scrambled to grab our equipment. Jackson seized his camera to document this bizarre encounter, while Arabella grabbed her trusty pocket knife that she'd carried since college. Their fear was unmistakable in their darting eyes and labored breaths. We couldn't call for help as phone reception was completely non-existent in these remote woods. Those around us were miles away, deaf to our unspoken pleas for rescue. But we couldn't just stand by and let this creature possibly harm us or anyone else who ventured into these woods unsuspecting. The creature prowled closer, its stealthy movements betraying an unseen intelligence beneath its monstrous demeanor. Everything about it screamed danger, but curiosity gnawed at us almost as ferociously as our fear. We whispered, plotting to investigate the creature's presence from a distance in the hope of finding some reasonable explanation for its existence. Armed with a little courage and our desperate hope for answers, we decided to follow the unearthly beast once it left the campsite. Slowly and cautiously, we moved through the dense underbrush of the thicket, relying on our ears to track it by sound. The cruel irony of pursuing such a gruesome predator did not escape me. During our pursuit, we stumbled upon a disturbing scene. Bloodied animal carcasses lay haphazardly strewn across a makeshift nest constructed from bones and torn fabric. It was clear that this creature had been here for a while. Muffled voices startled us, drawing our attention to a group of frightened campers who'd also been drawn to this macabre display. We exchanged anxious looks but hesitated to share what could be safely discussed given the dire circumstances. The creature was not far from us. Its throaty growls pummeled the darkness as it continued its gruesome meal. Mustering caution and stealth, I signaled for everyone to move as quietly as possible in order not to draw attention and find cover within the dense vegetation. Jackson nervously quipped about how our humdrum office job seemed infinitely more appealing at that moment, earning a shaky chuckle from everyone despite our mortal predicament. As we inched our way through thorny vines and choking roots, my mind raced with dread and uncertainty. What would we tell others if we survived this night? Would they even believe us? The creature suddenly let out an ear-splitting scream that filled every corner of the woods. Searing pain erupted in my ears while my vision twisted into an ever-narrowing tunnel. Instinct took over as I mustered every ounce of strength towards getting away. Desperation fueled us all as we sprinted our way back to the campsite fully aware that the abomination would be hot on our heels surely. With adrenaline pounding in our veins and breath ragged, we plunged ourselves into the uncertainty that lay before us, hoping against all hope for salvation. It was now a frenzied game of cat and mouse, a life-or-death pursuit through the ever-shifting coursers of tangled foliage. I feared for the lives of my friends— and of the others unwittingly facing this horrendous beast in the darkness. As we reached the edge of the campsite, my heart dropped. Everyone had fled. Apparently, our friends had heard the screams too, and they decided to bail out. Their tents were abandoned and their belongings left behind. 
our chances of survival seemed slim, with the creature closing in. Sam proposed that we keep running and regroup with the rest. Before any of us could object, the beast crashed through the foliage, nails razor sharp, eyes glowing in a deep shade of menacing red. It screeched again, shaking me to my very core. We needed to find help. I whipped out my phone and dialed emergency services, my hands trembling with fear as I held it against my ear. Help us! I frantically screamed into it. There is a creature attacking us. We're at Camp Cypress. Please hurry! Despite still being able to hear the blood-curdling cries of the monster in the background, preparations for an immediate dispatch were underway. My pulse raced faster than ever before. We had little to no time left as we sprinted blindly farther from the beasts but without a plan or direction. Then Jackson spotted an old cabin in the woods, our only potential refuge. We barged into the decaying structure and locked every door leading outside, praying and hoping that this would dissuade or delay our pursuer for rescue to arrive in time. However, it didn't take long for it to come into view, charging straight towards us without mercy, teeth bared, claws slashing through everything that stood between us. But something bizarre happened as soon as it reached the entrance of the cabin. A sudden hesitation loomed over its monstrous expression. It peered around defensively before eventually retreating back into the shadows that once concealed its malicious intentions. Unbeknownst to all of us was an etch on an ancient stone tablet hanging by one of the windows, outlining a folklore creature with a matching description and stance. The name... Mortigo was engraved at the bottom right, and a single word followed. Tilatroff, which I could only guess was a location. As we stood there, relief washing over us, we realized that perhaps we'd have a chance to survive this nightmare. However, the idea of finding the meaning behind the etching quickly vanished when I locked eyes with a lifeless body concealed beneath the rubble of the cabin's spiraling stairway. I felt my gut twist tight in horror. We weren't the first ones here. Several days later, we were rescued by authorities from our newfound haven. The encounter with Mortigo had ended just as quickly as it began. We had survived, but not without scars not only mental but dermal too. We mourn those who were taken by the vicious creature, especially Lisa that unknowingly became its gruesome meal. Memories of her flooded back as we toasted to her memory during the memorial service. Despite having spent most of my life near Tilatroff's woods, Mortigo was a hidden mythical monster whose secret identity remained unknown for centuries. Until then. It seems there are still creatures lurking in the dark corners of forests and regions yet to be discovered. We're fortunate to have made it out alive, but now our world has been cracked open. It's impossible to ignore that there are horrors far beyond what our minds ever thought possible. We don't understand why it attacked or where it came from. Possibly, we never will. Life must go on, but one thing remains certain— no one will ever venture into these woods carelessly again. I remember the morning clearly, as I wandered through the woods with my trusty camera in hand. The sun was shining, casting a beautiful glow through the tall redwood trees. I'm Asa Hutchinson, freelance photographer, and nature enthusiast. My love for photography had led me to many remote destinations, but nothing could have prepared me for what happened that day. I was in Northern California's Redwood National Park, a seemingly peaceful and serene location. With every step that I took, small rocks and twigs crackled underfoot while red-winged blackbirds sang cheerfully. Through each generation, 
people like me have roamed these quiet forests to capture images and memories of the natural world around them. As I found a perfect spot to snap some photos of the sunlight dappling against a blooming rhododendron bush, I overheard two other hikers talking about some kind of monster in a hushed tone. They described it as a large creature covered in thick fur with enormous claws and teeth. My antennae sprang up in curiosity. Sure enough, these presumably wild tales were nothing more than urban legends traveling from park visitor to park visitor. As I continued my trek toward the scattered picnic area, my thoughts revolved around that strange conversation. In my skepticism, I chuckled because now it felt like those scary stories were part of folklore or even our cultural heritage. Feeling peckish after reaching the picnic area, I unpacked my lunch onto one of the empty benches when loud shouts came from within the forest. Help! Somebody help! Two park rangers rushed into the wooded area with fearful expressions plastered all over their faces. This wasn't acting. A man named Lee Thatcher said he was nearly attacked by this so-called creature. As much as they searched high and low for any traces or clues, they found no sign of whatever nearly attacked Lee. As panic began to envelop the group, the rangers enlisted the help of a few hikers, me included, to aid in their search for the creature. We branched out into the dense woods and delved deeper into the forest than any navigation device could guide us. As we moved inward, a large rock face loomed over a wide clearing. Ancient and overgrown, the inscriptions and artwork plastered across its face looked like they predated most American settler history. At first glance, nothing seemed out of the ordinary as we approached the rock formation. Suddenly, I caught a glimpse of unusual claw marks visible on one side of the ruin. An oddity indeed, but not reason enough to jump to supernatural conclusions. However, as we continued forward, it became apparent that something strange was occurring. Animal cries filled the air as our party ventured deeper into a ravine. I couldn't shake off a looming yet unexplainable sense of dread creeping up my spine. We stumbled upon bones of various creatures littering the forest floor and covering it in spots with their once bloody remains. It appeared as though these poor animals were mauled ferociously by something far stronger than themselves. As we picked our way through an area filled with bones and fur, we suddenly heard more desperate cries from ahead within even denser undergrowth, shouting for help. We hurried towards those pleas when out of nowhere, it appeared, a fearsome beast covered in thick fur from head to toe. Its feral eyes glared menacingly at us with an unquenchable hunger for blood. The teeth that filled its monolithic maw seemed like they could tear through solid steel while its claws could only be described as deadly daggers protruding from its hulking mass. An elderly man named Gerald Meeks was pinned beneath one gigantic paw. He was bleeding heavily from numerous claw marks across his body, but still conscious enough to tell us what happened. I tried to escape, but it caught up to me. I couldn't defend myself. Looking around in horror-stricken realization, we now understood that this wild predator, sensing easy prey nearby, had been waiting for someone desperate enough like Gerald. As the creature stood over Gerald, ready to devour him, our small group of survivors tried to figure out how it could be stopped. Did we have enough firepower? What would drive this terrifying beast away from the trapped man beneath its massive paw? The answer eluded as panic seized us all. We looked at each other, our faces etched with fear. We knew that running was futile, that monstrous creature would easily outrun us. But standing there, doing nothing, was not an option either. I glanced at the others and shouted, Get to higher ground! I'll distract it! I picked up a large rock and threw it at the beast. It turned its attention to me as the rock bounced off its hide. My companions scrambled up the incline we were on. However, 
Gerald had lost too much blood and couldn't move quickly enough. I yelled for help from our group, hoping they might have an idea or two on how to save him. Jack was quick to respond, shouting back at me with urgency. There's a hunter's hut nearby. Let's get Gerald there. I nodded and rushed to Gerald's side while Jack supported him on his other side. Together, we lifted him as best we could and made our way toward the hut Jack mentioned. The creature lunged in our direction, but I tossed another rock at it, causing a brief moment of distraction. As we drew closer to the hut, we spotted a figure standing in the doorway, an old woman who appeared unfazed by the approaching danger. Hurry! she called out, motioning us inside. We managed to drag Gerald inside just as the beast reached the entrance of the hut. The old woman slammed the door shut and secured it with a bar meant for that very purpose. I turned to her in disbelief, realizing that this must have been her home for some time now. How did you survive here? This creature has been terrorizing us since we entered this area. The old woman replied calmly. That creature is known as Jikininki in local folklore, said to feast upon human flesh. At my stunned expression, she explained further. I've lived here for years undetected by Jikininki because I've learned to mask my scent from him. She silently helped us tend to Gerald's wounds, expertly applying bandages and offering a glass of water. I couldn't help but marvel at her knowledge and composure amidst such chaos. In the meantime, Jack placed a phone call to the nearest rescue center while the rest of our group entered the hut after evading the persistent creature outside. We spent hours inside the hovel, listening to the relentless scratching and growls as the Jikininki attempted to break in. The old woman lit lamps around the hut, providing some warmth in the dimly lit space. She suggested that we sleep in shifts preparing ourselves for another onslaught when daylight came. As morning broke, we found that Jikininki had retreated into the shadows of the forest. We took this opportunity to pack up and leave as quickly as possible, while the old woman opted to remain in her home that she had successfully protected all these years. With heavy hearts, we carried Gerald on an improvised stretcher, and made our way back towards civilization where immediate medical attention was sought for him. Massively grateful for our chance encounter with that mysterious knowledgeable old woman, we knew that without her assistance, Gerald would not have made it out alive. As we moved further away from that dreaded area and reported our encounter with Chikininki to local authorities, we remembered those who had fallen victim to its brutal attacks. We vowed never to forget their names or faces. Their memory would drive our commitment to spreading awareness about this ghastly creature and encouraging others to avoid its territory. Unimaginable horrors lurk within nature's beauty. Our experiences with Jikininki were proof positive of that chilling truth. And yet, through teamwork, determination and an unexpected ally in that old woman, we managed not only to survive but also to ensure such terrors didn't claim more lives. The shadows of the forest and the terrifying nights couldn't defeat us, and those memories will stay with us forever, a haunting reminder that safety can never be guaranteed, and vigilance is paramount.